We're ready now. Good morning. I'd like to call the Planning Commission meeting of February 11th, 2016 to order. Let the record show all the commissioners are here and staff. At this point, I'd like for you to join with me. First, salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our first item is a selection of the Planning Commission Chair and Vice Chair. Do we have any nominations? I'd like to nominate uh, our present chairperson to continue on for another year. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. We also need a Vice Chair. I would nominate Mr. Arnold for another term. Second. It's been moved and seconded for Ted to continue as vice chair. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, thank you. And thank you for uh, that vote of confidence. And we're going to do the best we can, aren't we, Ted? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you seconded the motion for Ted. Are there any agenda changes today? No. Okay, no agenda changes. Next, we have our public comment period. If there's someone in the audience who would like to address the Planning Commission on a land use item that is not on our agenda this morning, this would be your opportunity. Okay, seeing no one, we are going to move to the consent agenda, which is the approval of minutes from the January 28th, 2016 Planning Commission meeting. Any Revisions, corrections. I will note, I think both um, uh, David and Lisa were not in attendance at that meeting. I have no changes. Okay. Would there be a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Abstain. Abstain. Okay. And two abstentions. Next is our public hearing 2015-075 appeal of the 2015-002 administrative use permit for California RSA number 3 LP doing business as Verizon Wireless. So I will turn this over to Darcy. Good morning, Darcy Gallart with the Planning Department. This is a continued public hearing item, um, continued from December 10th of last year. The Commission held a public hearing to consider the appeal for the administrative use permit for Verizon Wireless. Um, at the hearing, there were some issues brought up regarding the stated decibel levels um, that came out of the acoustical analysis. At that time, um, there wasn't a set decibel level that we were looking at, um, just because the Commission didn't want to lock them into, you have to meet 40 or you have to meet 30. Um, so basically the direction was go back, see what you can do to lower the decibel levels. Um, so Verizon did that. So there's various things that they have done to further reduce the decibel levels. If you recall the previous site plan layout, the decibel level um, with what they were doing was putting these cabinets in an enclosure was 48 decibels. And that was the, previously it was 48. 48 at the property line. Correct. Um, so what they have done is they have eliminated the equipment shelter um, and they're replacing uh, the outdoor radio cabinets. And basically it will be a three-sided, eight-foot CMU block wall. Um, and then along the front will be a chain link fence. I'll have an exhibit so you can actually see that. Um, it will be covered by a wooden roof. The chain link fence will basically serve as ventilation. They've rotated the fans to basically 180 degrees to face the back part of the block wall. Um, and then they will be installing, we've talked a little bit last time about that acoustical curtain. So they'll be installing the noise curtain along the interior of those three um, block walls. Now what this does is it reduces the decibel level to 41 decibels at the southeast boundary um, and 37 at the southwest boundary. So the southeast boundary is the closest property line to um, where the structure would be. The southwest or east? <coughs> uh, the southeast is the closest boundary line. So at the closest boundary line, the decibel level is now 41, is predicted to be 41. 
at the southwest boundary, which is a little further away, it's 37. Could you also, because the commission has heard about decibel levels when it came to traffic way, way back when, but I had forgotten the, the formula. When you increase decibel levels by a certain amount, you're doubling it. Do you recall that? Um, you weren't here uh, possibly on that issue, but it had to do with traffic. I don't recall and that. Um, there's a there's a formula it, 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 the increase is an exponential increase in terms of the sound perceived and it's I not, see mr. Howard digging relationship that, that's correct the, the it, it's uh, what was the term you just used it's not linear it, it's it's, um, it's exponential. exponential thank you um, and I don't recall off the top of my head the, the you know but it's you know certainly more than doubling of, of the sound, so a little one decibel increase is, um, yeah, I think it's a doubling of the sound it, level. It, yeah, um, a decibel increase is a doubling of the perceived sound level at any one mm -hmm. place. So in this case, we've got an eight decibel or seven decibel reduction calculated for this property line. For the southeast. So you can assume some, some more than double, but uh, more than, uh, less than half, some some small fraction of what right. it would have been. Is it fair to say? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I, this was a big issue of way back when. So we were discussing the noise element of the general plan. We had correct. quite a discussion of that how you, how sound is perceived and measured. Yeah, we got a little education on it that time. So th this is the outcome of the revised acoustical analysis. Um, was that a combination of the block walls um, rotating the equipment and utilizing that noise curtain would further lower, lower those decibel levels. So if you recall, the noise ordinance maximum decibel level for residential is 50. So these new revisions drop those decibel levels well, well below that maximum threshold. So Actually, you know, I'm going to go to the next slide and then we'll go back. This right here is where the existing tower is. The existing equipment is here. Um, we've got this property line. So from here to here is 37. From here to here is 41 decibels. So this is a, a drawing of the new equipment plan. We've got the block walls here. This will be chain link, which will help with the ventilation. Um, the actual cabinets will, will be here, so the fans will face this wall right here, and then the noise curtain will be installed along the interior of that. <coughs> Any questions? Nope. Just cleared my throat. Okay. So I was just showing you the new elevations um, because you'll see it, it's obviously going to look a little bit different, but they're trying to <coughs> recess it a little bit into the ground. So the visual that you would see um, is really only what's above ground here. So this is the top of the hill where the existing tower is. Um, the equipment would be moved downhill. So this is one of the elevations that would be seen. And this would be if you were looking from Bow Drive up towards the property. You'd have to be actually on the property to see this because there are some trees. But this is the open part where the chain link fence is um, and the tower behind that. Back up one slide, please. Um, does that indicate that the equipment shelter is um, part, partly uh, excavated into Correct. the hillside? Yeah. Correct. So if the commission um, is satisfied with the revisions that were made, and hold on. Um, condition of approval 1-7 is going to need some modifications to it to reflect those changes. So originally, I apologize, this was crossed out before. This. I don't want to show it up on here, so we'll just do this. The original condition of approval um, started here prior to final inspection um, and prior to sign off. They would have to install, previously if you remember that, acoustical curtain. So what we're proposing to do is basically strike this language right here from that condition and we would be adding that an eight foot tall CMU wall would be installed 
they would be rotating that equipment um, and they would be installing that noise curtain. So some people might think, you know, the revised drawings show that. Why are we adding a condition of approval to this? To sort of state what we already know is going to happen. Um, if you recall, this was actually, this condition came out of the environmental document and it was a mitigation measure. So we can't just strike it completely and not have it there. We're proposing to modify that. It's a, basically a mitigation measure to reduce that. If we didn't have this on at all, they may exceed that 50 decibel level. So this condition of approval would be modified to reflect those new changes that came out of that acoustical analysis. Um, so, like I said, and I'm sorry that it won't show up, that it's a strikeout. We would be striking out the language that previously referred to um, that acoustical curtain and adding in the language about the new structure with the roof, the, the acoustical curtain lining, and rotating those um, fans towards that wall. Another um, item that was discussed at the meeting previously that um, there was no real true resolution to, so I, I'm bringing it back up, was there's condition of approval 1-8, which talks about the servicing of the equipment. And last time there was a discussion about um, the concerns about, well, what if they came in and gave you a notice every 72 hours to do um, maintenance on their tower? You know, can we put a limit on them? So I'm only bringing this one up because um, I'm not sure that there was actually a resolution on it if the commission wanted to entertain modifying this condition to put limits on how often per year. I think um, they stated, we talked about maybe they do it once a quarter, uh, maybe they do it you know, once a month. So I only brought it up because there wasn't any sort of a resolution. I didn't want to leave it hanging. This was, is with, with respect to routine maintenance, not uh, uh, fixing a breakdown. Right, this is, this is for their routine maintenance that they do. Um, there were concerns brought up by one of the appellants that um, it's sort of open-ended and who's to say that they can't do it five times a month and then it becomes a disruption. So um, I'm bringing it up because we truly didn't have a resolution to how to deal with this one. It was sort of left open. So the recommendation that's, do you need to go back? No. So the recommendation that staff has this morning is to deny the appeals, which would uphold the planning director's approval of the administrative use permit um, with the suggested condition change, or changes to condition seven. That concludes my presentation. I believe both appellants are here as well as the representative for Verizon. And I can answer any questions you might have before. Can you go back to figure one, please? Um, realizing it may be off of this chart, but uh, where's the nearest dwelling? In which direction? Um, there's a home here. Okay, so that... And that's uh, the southeast boundary. Uh-huh. And then one of the appellants, the Hadleys, their home is on this property. Um, I may still have an aerial that would give you a better look. Yeah, I, I see it. See it now? Uh-huh. So yeah, the... Um, That's the tower. The really? tower is in this location. Oh. Approximately a little bit down the hill where it'd be relocated. Uh-huh. This would be the um, closest how... Well, this is the closest boundary. That's the southeast boundary. Right. So Fine. this is one property and then the Hadleys are right here. Got it. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Any other questions to Darcy? Do you have any idea how many cell phone users are dependent on that particular tower? I do not, but Verizon may provide that information for you. Can you go back to the um, uh, condition of approval, the first one, and and tell me how that would read with your your um, your suggested change? It would read prior to the final inspection. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not that one. The next one, the one that's got a. a Oh, no, that's the one. I'm sorry. Okay. Prior to the final inspection and sign-off of the facility by the planning department. Uh, you know what? I'm missing a word. It should say the applicant shall install an 8-foot tall CMU wall with a roof. Oh, wait, no, that's right. An 8-foot tall CMU wall with a roof shall be constructed around three sides of the radio cabinets. The fan shall face inward towards the wall and a noise curtain installed along the inside face of the three walls. 
Okay, the last? The last part was from the previous condition that should be struck out. I tried to strike it out, but it just doesn't show up on the PowerPoint. But nevertheless, an acoustical curtain is part of the... Right, and that's the last part of that, and a noise curtain installed along the inside face of the three Okay, walls. I got it. Any other questions of Darcy before we open the public hearing? Um, no, but what, what, do we want to discuss the uh, operational uh, CAO, COA uh, first and then open that up? Or? As far as you're talking about time um, uh, of maintenance? Ye that yeah, kind of did we, we need to have a discussion of that? or? or? I don't, I think I'd like to hear, I have a few questions of the, um, uh, from Verizon about that. I know we talked about it before, but. Fine. Yeah. I agree. Good? Okay. So this would the, um, uh, I guess we would go to the, hold on, the appellant's presentation? Would yeah. that be, yes. So looking at my procedures here. You've got to do it right. I try. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just appreciate there's only one thing on the agenda. That's wonderful. Well, uh, no, we got a lot more on the agenda. Oh, you do. You're just first. I'd like to appreciate being the first one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be here to all about. Stay all yeah, day. that's yeah, true. We'll be here. I've been uh -huh. in enough of these meetings. Well, thank you, but I will. I will. Uh, um, my name's Dan Hadley. Uh, we're the property owner that pointed out on the, uh, I don't know, southwest, I guess it is, side of the property. Um, we bought the property. It had a telephone pole in the back with antennas on it. Um, it had a box at the bottom with a... Uh, Looked like a filing cabinet made no noise whatsoever. And their, their use permit that they're upgrading in this round is going from that, from a 42-foot pole and a filing cabinet that had a light hum on it. Um, and this is the upgrade to that. So obviously, our, our concerns have been visual and uh, noise and then uh, disruption at night. Those are our three primary concerns. Um, Verizon has done a, an excellent job in this last go around on trying to reduce the sound. Um, to answer your question, the, my reading of the way decibels work is, is 10 decibels is a doubling of the sound energy. Um, so that, to clarify what you were asking earlier. Um, so a change from say uh, 30 to 50 is a doubling of that sound energy. It's another doubling to go up from 40 to 50. Um, and Verizon might be able to, to add to that but that's the that's the very basic sign um, I've been I have a decibel meter and um, I've been taking some readings generally in my front yard it runs about 30 decibels at night so that's currently what the front yard is running I really can't take readings in the backyard because the assembly was built via building permit that they issued um, so it's running they did some very good mitigation issues um, around the outside to get it at least below the um, the county maximum standard while we go through this process so um, I, I applaud that. Um, as far as the, the actual, probably they've called the first condition of approval, um, the, the process started at 48 decibels, which is technically three decibels less than I can call the sheriff and have it abated. So we're talking about a level where 50 decibels is where you can have it shut down. Anything, a party next door, your neighbor running his car in the middle of the night, that's, that's the maximum threshold. Um, and the initial assembly was at 48. Obviously, it's understandable why I think two decibels less than the maximum um, was not acceptable. And in this last go round, I think they did an excellent job in redesigning it. Um, they dug it into the hillside more than it was before. They surrounded it by a block wall and they put a roof on it. And, that, and then when that wasn't quite enough, they put the sound curtains on the inside of the structure to absorb the sound and turn the machines. So I, my personal opinion is they've done an excellent job at reducing the sound level. Um, it's still going to be double the sound level that I have currently, but my wife and I have talked and, and we kind of feel like there's going to have to be some give and take. And, you know, if it was a, if it was a, if it was somebody's air conditioner running during the summer months when it's hot, we'd have a lot more flexibility. The fact that this thing runs 24-7, 365 is why we've been here appealing this to the, to the um, commission. Um, to make it short and sweet, I think the 37 at our property is going to be fine. Um, I don't have an issue with it. My concern is that 
the building obviously is being built larger to accommodate future equipment and change out of equipment. And all I'm asking at this point is that the condition, that condition of approval be written more to address that the assembly won't exceed the 37 decibels in the future as the, as the use permit, more so than that that specific equipment won't exceed it. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a contentious issue because if it's built as it's designed, it's going to meet that threshold. And what that does is that provides protection in the future for us. So if they decide to take that large open area and say put a generator in there or something, we're not going to be back here again arguing the 50 decibel level. Um, so I, I agree with everything they've done. At this point with that portion of the construction, we don't have an issue with it as long as we have some limit on there saying that it's not going to exceed in the future that level. Um, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a use permit allowing a facility to go in. It would be unfair to us to go through this entire process to have that equipment changed out in a year to something that produces 48 decibels at our property line. So I'm not sure if I'm being clear on that, but that's what we would like to see added to that. Um, it's more important than how they physically build it. It's more important that that decibel level is met. Um, so that, that's what I'd have to say about that. Um, there is one piece of equipment in there. It's, the, it's listed as the 850. I'm not sure what it is, but it's 10 decibels louder than everything else. It runs it, if I read it right, 72 decibels. Um, it seems like if you could cut something out of there, if everything's running at 60 and one thing's running at 72, that if they can get that thing quieter or do something with it, they would drop it even below the 37. Um, but for what it's worth, I guess that's not super critical if I can have the 37 decibels. Um, as far as the servicing equipment, I, I think the only key on that would be <coughs> quarterly or something that's reasonable. Um, I'm a general contractor. If I was to go into your backyard and turn on my halogen lights and let my diesel truck idle and start working on a house at 2 o'clock in the morning and you ha I could send you a letter saying I can do it, I think you'd understand why after a few cycles you'd be pissed off. If it's quarterly or something, you know what, we're neighbors, right? Okay, so every four months they climb up the pole and they wake us up at night. I, I can't argue that. I just am afraid that, that it could get into a cycle where we're going to be there every Tuesday night and here's your letter and this we're holding up our use permit regulation. So that would be my only comment on that one. Um, beyond that, I think it is what it is. Um, the pole is designed to be a tight pole where all the antennas are tight to it. Um, that was a critical thing on our part <coughs> um, that it keeps it, I think they call it a stealth pole, is that what they call that pole? Yeah, it's a stealth pole. I know you've seen the ones with the big arms and all that. Their pole design is a stealth pole. Um, assuming that doesn't change, we don't have an issue with it. So I guess just my final comment is I'd like that 37 decibels at our property line to be written in as a condition of approval. Um, so if they change equipment, we're not impacted by it. That, that's my only thing. Is there any other questions I can answer while I'm up here. Any questions for Mr. Hadley right now? No, I don't think so. We may have some later though. Thank okay. you. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you can mind. <clears throat> questions uh, are perhaps a presentation or any thoughts you'd like to share from Verizon's perspective on this? I wasn't sure if the other appellant wanted to speak. Oh, that's true. The homeowners Would the other appellant like to speak? Um, so sorry. Briefly, yes. Sure, please. Thank you. And thanks for bringing that, bringing that up. My name is Jane Everett. I'm with the Homeowners Association. Um, I also want to reiterate what Dan said and my question of um, the noise level and what would happen should they switch out any type of equipment, I don't want to have to go through this again. I really don't. So I would like to make a request to Verizon that that be entered into our approval that they can't exceed the, um, the noise level should they start to put in new equipment or anything and that they keep it 
definitely below this 41 where they have it over here at the side. And that's going to be my request when the board goes to approve their, their, uh, their approval to go ahead and continue with this project. And I do want to thank them for being a good neighbor and trying to um, accommodate us with this because she's put a lot of work into it. But I still have concerns in the future for the, for the community up there and where we're headed. So I would like that, I will probably ask them to put that in as a condition of approval from our board. And I don't know where you stand and if this is a proper way to, just to inform you that that's what I had wanted to do. So. Great, thank you very Thank much. you. Good morning, um, Karen Leonard, Verizon Wireless. So um, as you see from the presentation, we've done a complete redesign of the project um, to bring down the noise. Um, we've basically done everything that the noise engineer recommended as far as the sound curtains inside the CMU wall, um, rotating the, the equipment. So um, we, we think we've been very accommodating on it. Um, as far as the, the conditions in question, I did have a couple of comments. Um, you know, clearly we're, we're making a very substantial investment to do this um, and technology changes all the time so we will be changing out equipment as things move forward um, typically what I've found is the equipment's getting quieter but I'm just reluctant to say let's put a 37 DB limitation at the property line and then if we're at 38 because we change out equipment then then you know we're in violation of our use permit so what I would prefer would be a condition that says that we will, you know, install all equipment in such a way as to minimize the noise impact. It would still be within that CMU wall. It would still have all of the, all of the noise, um, I'm sorry, I can't speak, <laughs> everything that we're putting in now to mitigate the noise. Um, and then, for example, the 850 equipment that Mr. Hadley brought up. The 850 equipment is the old original equipment that's operating in 850 megahertz frequencies. Um, we have customers who still are using that equipment. It is older technology. Over time, it probably will go away as we move towards LTE and different equipment. But that just gives you an example of how, as things change, the older equipment is louder. But customers who have older phones still rely on that older equipment to be able to make phone calls. So um, that's what I would ask for there. And then I'm with sorry, go, go back to what you suggested. Uh, uh, if there's a change, what, what, how do you think it should read? Well, I thought if, if it read in a way that says that we would install the equipment in a fashion, since, since turning those cabinets made a difference, um, that you know, through the building permit process, that we demonstrate that we're installing the equipment in a fashion that's minimizing any noise impact to the adjacent parcels so that we could look at that as we go through that process and not come back and say, uh-oh, they're at 38 now, because that, it could happen. It could get quieter. Um, the other issue is, you know, the reports that we have prepared are all models. Um, so what we're installing, you know, based on those models, he says it should be at about 37. It might be 34. It might be 39. I'm, so that's my concern with having, you know, a firm number there. But... I think we have done everything we can to minimize that and have been good neighbors in that sense. The, what is the noise generating component of the operation? Is it the fans or is it the, the electronic uh, equipment itself? I mean, there, there's actually radios that run, so there's a hum with that, and then there are fans that cool the equipment. So it's both. When you say radios that run, Mm -hmm. it, it, it's some kind of, it looks like a, a metal box with a bunch of lights and things going off on it. It's, Correct. It's a, it hums. It hums. And then the, the fan is what's cooling the... Yeah, and the, and the fan would be, I would say, the louder piece of equipment, but it all has to be cooled because it you know, right. gets hot as it runs. Okay. Okay. The, the fan, fan technology is what it is, right? It doesn't change much. It stays the same. Right. And that's the louder component, that's the louder portion of the entire operation? Is I would say yes to that. I mean, I would think that would be what we'd be making more noise. But for example, the 850 cabinet that Mr. Hadley referenced is an older cabinet that also has a fan. So that one is older, 
than our newer technology equipment. So as time goes on, yeah, the fan, fan technology probably also gets better to go along with it. But, you know, the newer equipment typically is getting quieter. But I'm just reluctant to have a, a permit condition that says, you know, the number is 37, so that if we hit 38, we're in, in violation of the use permit. I understand. I'm <clears throat> looking at a table here on page three of what we've been given that has reference noise level data for the proposed equipment cabinets. It's 53 for the Ericsson and 60 for the Charles Industries and so forth. Right. Do those numbers include the fan noise? Correct. The fans are built into the cabinets. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, when you combine all of these things running at once, it's 73 five feet away. And you've suggested you will be changing equipment out. Periodically, we do. Suppose there were a condition that put a limit on what the combined noise at the site, the five feet away, would be so that you wouldn't be putting in equipment that was putting out more noise totally than what's there now. Well, that's difficult because if we added a piece of equipment, you know, we, this, this may go up but still not be up at the property line or maybe up slightly at the property line. Um, as we add customers, I mean, if this area grows, and, and my concern is not right now. My concern is five years, seven years. Um, as, as more people move into the area, we have more customers. That requires additional radios. That's how we add capacity to our sites. So I don't want to limit our ability to serve customers in the area with a condition that's going to live with this permit forever. These radios, they make more or less noise depending on how much cell traffic is going through them? Is that the Well, I mean, if they're running, so if someone is on a call, that's when the radio would be running. So, um, I mean, the older technology, it used to be one radio per one cell phone call. So as, as things have gotten better, then they had three, three calls per radio. Well, now we've, you know, figured out new ways to split it. So, but, but there has to be radios for a, for a number of calls. So when someone makes a call, connects to that radio, it starts to run. So if no one's on the site, those radios aren't running. The fans may be running to keep the equipment cool based on temperature. But if no one is on those, on a call, those radios are not running. Do the fans increase or decrease in speed based upon the cooling needs of the box? I wouldn't say in speed. It's just they're either on or they're not. Oh, they're, it, it's like a thermostat. They Correct. cycle on or they cycle off? Correct. And they're off? Correct. So when it gets warm in there, they come back on. And then when it cools back down, they shut off. And, but they would, it would be warmer in there if the radios were on. So there's a cooling component of you know, the temperature outside the environment and then a cooling component of how much the equipment is actually running and heating up that area. So back, I back to the question I asked earlier, and that was, do you know approximately how many Verizon customers are relying on this particular part? What I have been told, and I don't know, you know exactly what the population is in the area, but is that about 40% of that population are Verizon customers. Then we also have tourists who visit the area that come with their Verizon phones and want to be able to make calls. So they didn't give me an, a number that like this site, pers you know, and specifically is using that, but that about 40% of the residents are customers of Verizon. I guess what I was getting at was how much of an emergency would it be if the unit went down? If that's the only communication 100 people have or three people have, there's a big difference. Yeah, no, it is, it's in the hundreds um, that rely on this. And, and it would be an emergency because a lot of people today don't have home phones. They just rely on cell phones. So I know when, when, when a site goes down, they get out to fix it right away. And then that brings me around to the other condition as far as the, the nighttime maintenance. Um, 
it's not something that we do routinely. It's only if something is going to be service affecting, with the exception of emergencies. If the site goes down, we'll come out and we'll fix it, um, you know, daytime or nighttime. But if we have maintenance issues that we need to do at night, the only time we're doing that if, is if we'd actually have to take the service down. It happens fairly infrequently, but what I wouldn't want to do is put a condition in that says, okay, you can only do it once a quarter if what we really needed was to do it two times in a quarter and no other time during the year. It's just difficult to say, you know, we, we will only do it once every three months because it really is, as technology changes, you know, we come out, they come out with a new antenna, they come out with a new piece of equipment. But the only time we do that nighttime work is if we have to take the site down to be able to provide the service. So and it's, you're doing that because it inconveniences less or fewer customers. Right. It's night. about the customers. As far as routine maintenance, I mean, our contractors certainly don't want to be out there at 2 in the morning, nor do our techs. You know, they want to, they'll be out there during normal business hours for routine maintenance. But it's just the things that are actually going to affect our customers we want to do when they're not using their phones. You. You purposely pick nighttime to do that kind of work so that you're interrupting the fewest number of calls? Correct. How many times last year did you have to do night services? In our network? <coughs> no, just no, like on at that this tower. Side. How many times were you out there at night last year? Uh, I believe it was one time during the cutover, but I don't know, Dan, do you have something different? <laughs> well, they're, they're out there more than once a year, obviously. We're there they're, more than once. They doing when they're setting up that tower. Okay, but as far as not, not doing the setting up the new tower, but as far as normal maintenance, how many times at night have you been woken in a year without that the upgrade, just doing normal maintenance? Currently, I have a tenant in there. Uh, we bought that house for our retirement. Okay. So there's currently a tenant in there, so I, I don't have the answer okay. for that. Um, you might be looking how often do you do routine maintenance? But it wouldn't be routine maintenance. It would be an antenna change out, a power upgrade, so um, I wouldn't think you typically would see more than three times a year. But again, as things change, they say, hey, guess what? We have this new great technology, and now we can transport people from house to house on their cell phones. <laughs> I mean, it's just, okay. it changes so much. I just don't know what to say over 20 years. Got but it. So perhaps rather than like a once a quarter, maybe just a certain number of times a year, giving the flexibility of, you know, going twice in a month and then not, then nothing for eight months and then one other time, something like that. Would yeah, that and the only thing is I don't know what that number would I, be. Right, right. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to um, commit something that, you know, over the long term is not, we'll I mean, maybe so if we are allowed so many times, but then there's a vehicle beyond that to, if something did, you know, because I'd hate to say, okay, they used up their, six allotted times and mm -hmm. now there's something they can't do for you know four more months right. um so i i think it would make it easier if at least there was a vehicle then to come in and say okay we used up our six um we'd like to go through this process or i don't know i'm just kind of thinking thinking yeah. out loud right good good any other questions of Karen, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name. You said it so fast. Leonard. Leonard, thank you. Not right now. Maybe a little later. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the Planning Commission on this Could AUP? I find yes, you may. But like, first, let me see if there's anyone else. Yes, that's why I asked. Doesn't look like it. So. Come on up. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Marty Crane. It, I'm just listening to all this and thinking, good neighbor, good neighbor. I love this. Um, but at some point, um, the Verizon representative is saying that she's concerned about what's going to happen in 20 years, maybe. Well, maybe in, no one has a crystal bar for, for 20 years for out. And maybe mm -hmm. what happens in 20 years, because we all know technology changes as soon as you buy it and take it home, it's, it's like outdated kind of thing. Uh, so it's constantly changing. So maybe, maybe they just have to come back in 20 years and say, hey, we got this, you know? What do the neighbors think? Because maybe it won't be the right location for whatever it is they have that they want to do in 20 years. And it just seems to me like as a resident right there, being Joe good neighbor saying, yes, let's work together, that, that seems like that would just um, 
eliminate any protection in 20 years for what they're trying to obtain. So, Thank you. Protect. I think it's your turn, Mr. Hadley. Yeah, we are trying to be rational. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, on the fans, just just FYI, they never turn off. Um, the compressors come on and off for them, but the fans are always on. I've never heard it when the fans were not running. Um, there's no doubt. During the day, um, you can definitely hear it, especially when it was at the higher level before they did that temporary measure. Um, but you can hear it anywhere in the yard, obviously, running. It's like your neighbor having an air conditioner, you know, the outside air conditioner from here to that wall, and you're standing next to it all day long. Um, so it runs 24-7. It never shuts off. It's not like if it's a cold day, the fans are not on. If you drive there right now, I'll lay this whole entire mission on the fact that those fans are running right now. Um, as far as the max levels, I agree. I think technology is getting better. Stuff's going to get quieter. It's already getting quieter because the old 850 is running at 73, and the stuff you guys just put in last year is running at 63. If that's the argument, which it is, I don't understand why you can't set 37 with the old loud equipment as a maximum level. Because otherwise, and, and Darcy might be able to clue me in on this, but if they come in with an application for a generator or something that runs at the 73, say 90 decibels or 100 decibels, and that generator is pushing 49 decibels over my fence, do I have the ability to stop that? Or is it, or is it going to run at 49 and they're under the legal limit? That's the purpose for the 37. We're, I would have loved to have 30, then I wouldn't even know it was there. 48, it's at the edge of calling the cops every single day. The 37, I think, is a good, I think we're halfway there. We're, we're double my sound energy that I currently have, and we're half of what they were proposing. So I think that's a good spot, and that offers that protection. Because like you said, you, you want to change out the equipment. What's the keeper from changing out the equipment in six months to something that's going to push up to 48 decibels? There's nothing in this that would stop that. Unless you can tell me otherwise, Darcy. Can answer? Sure. Yeah. If they're coming in to install a new generator that's not part of what has been approved, and it's a brand new additional piece of equipment, uh, it's not part of this approval process, so they'd have to go through a new permit process, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but... Um, there are some exemptions to adding new equipment and you know, increases uh, recent federal law exempted um, certain types of uh, expansions of cell facilities that um, if you didn't increase by a certain amount of height. Uh, I don't recall the specifics on equipment, but I believe it's sort of a similar provision. They're just you know, changing or adding new equipment as long as it's not an increase in the footprint area. Um, this is designed to look at, to to provide um, uh, additional equipment, obviously. Um, I have a suggestion that at, we could add a condition that at such time um, that um, new equipment is installed, they'll provide um, the department uh, acoustical analysis of that new equipment. And if it doesn't exceed a threshold, and uh, Mr. Hadley's um, reminded me, it sort of jogged my memory of the, the 10 decibel is indeed the, the doubling of the noise. Three decibels is the change in perception. You can, you can hear that. You know, you can say, oh, it's gotten louder at three decibels. And I would suggest that we, um, new equipment shall not increase the noise level at the property line by three decibels or more. So if you stay under three decibels, then you're, um, you're, you're good. So it provides some flexibility. It still protects the neighbors as far as, gee, I, I, it's, it's louder to me. Under three decibels, it's not really going to be perceptible to the human ear. You'll be able to, to meter it, but you won't be able to hear the difference. And so that may be a, um, a compromise that we can reach. It provides some flexibility for Verizon, same time protect the neighbors. Um, and we make sure that any new equipment comes in, we review that information to, to ensure that it's not going to. So they don't put in a 100 decibel piece of equipment, <coughs> that they're going to have to look at, at new or quieter technology if they're going to add stuff. When you say new equipment, are you talking about additional equipment or replacement equipment? Could be any. Could be either. Okay. 
With I mean, if they replace something that has the same, they could just provide us the, the spec sheet that says, here's the reading at five feet, and it matches what's replacing, we won't need to go through a full analysis. If it's a brand new piece of equipment, then they'll probably have to have something more along the lines of what we got uh, with this, this application. With respect to the three decibel uh, component that you're suggesting, um, <coughs> from what point? Because right now we've got We've got a 37 here, but everybody understands that's a projected 37. That's a computer modeled 37. We don't know yeah. what the number is going to be, uh, and we were, you know, we've been told it could be a little yeah. less or could be a little bit more. And so, they would use the same modeling with the new equipment. So we so it'd be based upon the model. Based upon the model, because um, you really couldn't do it after the fact. That once it's installed, it's installed. Unless you know, we want to require them to pull. You know, based upon a model from a competent. Com uh, Right. Acoustical and we're, we're, we're accepting the uh, analysis done by um, <coughs> Bollard or whoever it is that did this, um, this analysis, that that's accurate, you know, based on professional recommendation, um, reputation on these numbers. And we're relying on that as part of our... Uh, so that would be our benchmark then, the modeling. Yeah. And, and it would be measured at the property line, so the change would be at the property line where it affects the neighbors. Here, a suggestion. It's reasonable. I mean, that's a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to go, honestly, I think it's going to go in the other direction as far as the equipment that's already installed. I think it's going to get quieter over time. It's a question of what comes in that's not on that. That's yeah. a big building for some kind of future equipment, mm -hmm. and that's what concerns me. Well, it's all cumulative. If it's just adding new equipment, it's going to increase the noise. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, it's even if it is quieter. Yeah. Right. Does that uh, whole thing have a uh, uh, co-locating issue involved? Well, it's pretty well maxed out right now, as far as I can tell, by the, um, the design. So the ability to co-locate additional um, antenna on that is probably not feasible. Um, they could come in and ask for another replacement if they want, if they thought this was such a great location and another carrier wanted to go in there, um, but that's probably unlikely at this point. And that would be a whole new application. Oh, don't make my day. <laughs> 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 um, the only other thing I would say is that it, it, we're, we're aware that that site is a, is a premium site for me because of where it sits and um, that a lot of people depend on it. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't pushed the the, the uh, uh, cease and desist order to have it turned off that the county issued to them because we understand that that would affect people. Um, you know, I wouldn't feel right forcing them to shut that thing off based on that cease and desist and then have somebody have a heart attack and couldn't call out. Um, at the same time, if that tower is that important to the community, there's a lot of empty hillsides that aren't in the middle of a residential area. There's and a lot of what? There's a lot of empty hillsides that aren't in the middle of a residential area. Um, Those are called view sheds in our, our world. <laughs> All I know is that they're not in the neighborhood. So if it was really a critical site, I mean, they're rebuilding the entire site for the most part, except for the actual tower. And if it was that critical, they could put it somewhere else. But I'm not after that. I'm just after some type of controls on the, the visual and the sound in our backyard. And I, you can all understand that. This thing runs 24-7. It never shuts off. So, um, any other? It doesn't look so at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, if I could. On the night maintenance, we're flexible. I'm not trying to say once, once a quarter or something. I, we're flexible on it. My concern was more that they show up once a week or once every other week and work a night. If they want to have six nights, they can work on it a year unless they have to get special approvals. I'm fine with that. I mean, we're rational people, right? I guess that's the right way to put it. But not having any control on it whatsoever could lead us to, to them being there every third night. Can I ask you a question, please? Sure. Come on up, Marty. I just wanted to understand. Um, I believe somebody mentioned cumulative and then the three decimal. I'm sorry, um, Marty, can you speak up just oh, a I'm little sorry. bit? Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, Mr. Maurer mentioned the cumulative effect of, of noise and also the difference between 10, like, oh, my stars, it's untenable, and three decimals being something that you don't even notice. Well, and then the lady from Verizon, uh, Ms. Leonard, 
um, mentioned that technology is changing so fast that that perhaps uh, um, they would you know don't want to um, put a wall up where they can't address those and move forward with new technology. So I'm just wondering all of a sudden, okay, so April comes along, great new technology. It's going to be less than three decimals, so they get to just go ahead and do whatever they're, you know, advance and improve as long as it doesn't exceed three decimals. Then September comes along and same thing, as long as it doesn't exceed three decimals. And then another four months, well, now you've just gone nine, but maybe people didn't notice. But isn't that the cumulative that you were talking about and I just wonder, this is like, I lived in the city, LA for 25 years and, and the hum of the city makes people crazy. I mean, it just, it, it's very detrimental to people's health and, and after a while they don't notice it but it still has an impact. And I, I just wondered if they're looking for some kind of a, 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 a guarantee that their life savings that they put into this home and this property is not going to, at some point, be incrementally um, uh, untenable or unlivable, then I'm, I don't know. I just wanted some clarification on that. Thank you. I think I was under the impression that that would be, uh, you know, three decibels would be the maximum, not per equipment. So you have a... I meant, I meant per... Um, right, every time you have... It, yeah, not three per change. It's, it's just like three decibel, that's it. So you can change as much as you want as long as the, all of those changes don't... Right. So, would never, never, never go over 40. Well, not at that property boundary, right. The other one is still is going to be 43 then, potentially. Right? 44. We, 44. We can, I'm sure we can clarify the condition that it's yeah. from this baseline period right. today, not, right. not cumulative. I have one other just quick I sure. Just, I, I thought you might bring it up, but you didn't, so I'm, I'm going to bring it up. Um, and I know it doesn't necessarily re amount to the county side of it, but the Copper Cove requires that all improvements be approved by the Homeowners Association Architectural Review Board prior to application to the building and planning departments. And I just want to make, make it a note, legal note, that that has not occurred yet. So the, bo and the board, I think, is even leaning on not approving the project. So I don't know how you stop a if the board says that they uh, do not approve the project, I don't know how the county can approve it. Um, and I don't know if Jane wants to, to say anything about that, but they bypassed that first step in order to get to this step. And, and I'm a little concerned if the board does not approve the project, are they going to be legally able to build the project on the site without taking on Verizon? Because they bypassed that prior approval per their homeowner agreement. Um, so anyway, I just wanted it on record that that's where it stands currently. All right, thank you. I don't know the. We do not review the CCNRs. It's a private agreement between the property owners and the homeowners association. And as long as they meet the county requirements, we have an obligation to issue the permit. Uh, there would be a civil matter between the homeowner association and the property owner if they um, violated the terms of the agreement. All right, thank you. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. And then I'm going to ask Ms. Um, Leonard to come back up. Okay. Um, I do have Karen's um, reconstructed plans now. My thing, too, is I would like to work better with your planning board because in times as these things start to go through, I don't want to be not a nice neighbor, but I would like to keep a handle on our community because it's a beautiful community. It's peaceful and quiet. And Dan is right. I could find no past history on Verizon as to how they even got into that lot. So in future, when things start to come into our community, I'd like to keep a handle on it. And to work closer with you or to know when Verizon's going to be doing these things, um, will they be required to at least come to us? Because to me, they should approach us first and then come to you or do you feel that that's you know I, I would really appreciate that because then we know and we can go from there and maybe this whole situation where we are now would never have occurred because quite frankly the flack is that I, there's hardly a week goes by I don't get a call 
and I can't answer them, and I can't give them satisfaction. I mean, they're angry that something like this, and they weren't told about it until this uh, came about. So there's, there's sometimes um, a glitch in communication, and I would like to work better with the county, but we do have our association rules. And again, what am I doing if we can't institute our association rules in order to keep our association in a safer place? Right. No, I, I understand that. I think it would just be difficult for the county to understand and all of the association rules and all, you know, it's throughout yeah, the county. Absolutely. And the thing is, is um, when some, we have tried and gone back to look at what you have in place so that we can maybe, we're going to start instituting some of these things, but we don't want to put certain things in if they're going to be in ours forever and then you guys go ahead and you have this meeting and everything changes. And then we're like, okay, the county did this, but now we have this in place. And they're going to say, hey, you changed this. Now that everybody will go and come to you, and here we sit again, no communication. But I mean, I would like to make it a um, definite that Karen agree with this noise level, that we keep it at that and that she would sign that we don't um, in the future, say even 10 years out, that we don't change that requirement as, a, as um, how I will approve that, that application. All right. I don't know. Well, we're thank you. Thank you very much. Then I do understand the frustration of that. <coughs> Ms. Leonard? Would you like to ask me questions or I would you like me to respond? Well, why don't you, I mean, why, why don't you respond and then maybe um, address uh, Mr. Maurer's proposal as far as what, how that, that, that sets with you to right. Verizon? Um, it seems to make sense to me. I, I think, um, you know, that's what I'm looking for and it's not that Certainly I have any intent that, no, I want to bring, bring in bigger and louder equipment, but I'm, I'm tasked with having Verizon build a site that has some flexibility to it. Mm -hmm. It likely is, and, it, and I agree with Mr. Hadley, it likely is that it will get quieter over time. Um, we, we have eliminated a generator from this project. I just want to make that clear. There's no room for a generator. If in the future, you know, someone were to propose a generator, it would have to go back through the planning process because there's not space for it mm -hmm. in, in our footprint. Um, that footprint is bigger than our equipment for a couple of reasons, flexibility and growth, but also for the ventilation because we've enclosed that on three sides and put a roof on it. Mm -hmm. So we can't make it the size of the equipment or it would just be overheating all the right. time. So um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Okay. Are there any questions of Ms. Leonard? No, I guess not. Thank you. Anyone else before I close the public hearing? Okay, so I'll bring it back to the Planning Commission for deliberation. Questions? Well, I think Mr. Mauer's proposal makes sense. I do too. I'm reading it up there and it reads quite well. So we've added, oh, you just put it in there. I'm like, wow. Added, <laughs> yeah. Mind, mind well, that, we, that's why we won't need phones anymore. Pretty soon it's just going to be like that. So I added two new conditions rather than trying to make a very lengthy one. The 1-9 one specifies the maximum decibel levels at each property line, and that's per the acoustical analysis. 1-10 states that any new equipment shall not increase those maximum, those approved maximum decibel levels by three. Um, and then they have to submit information regarding those decibel levels prior to approval and installation. Just a quick question on that. I thought we were saying that once the equipment goes in, because they said when the equipment goes in that this Ballard acoustical study is, obviously it's not in, so this is their study and approximate. I thought the three decibels could be their waiver point. You're saying the three decibels is on new equipment only? That was my understanding, but if not, we can change it. Well, well so if they were to put the equipment in based it's on this and it's 38, then they didn't, well, the way that that's worded, it didn't pass. I thought right. there was a three decibel waiver on both directions. 
whether it be the new equipment or once this goes in. I mean, I liked when she said she thinks it'll be 34 maybe. <laughs> that was better. Right. Well. Well, we can. I mean, if it comes in at 38, then their whole project is blown up. But that's not what they're saying in this. They're saying if new equipment goes in, it can only waiver three. Well, that's what they're asking for permission to do the project. How do you read it? Interpret that for us, the, Peter. The way that condition reads is it would it, have it's, to be. Um, and I would add LEQ after the decibel because it's, um, it, there could be, you know, it's, it's an average. There could, could be times when it's right. slightly above, but then it's going to be quieter. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that we have our, because a single reading exceeding that could is trigger. not going to violate the terms of the, right. of the use permit. Um, so we can delete nine, make 10 nine, and then just right. add. You know, I didn't understand when we're doing nine. Yeah, I, I just thought I, whatever, I whatever it is now, you can't increase it with new equipment. I, I, I think we're, we're basing our approval on the modeling that was done. Um, with the understanding, belief that it's accurate and it will be you know, within that range. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's one decibel higher or lower, it, we won't notice it. Right. Um, and I think that, that you know, I, I have to rely on the expertise of the acoustical expert. Um, you know, if it's, if it's significantly above that, then I think we've got, you know, the potential of, you know, bad information and we have to come back and revisit this issue if it you know mr hadley says wait a second this is a lot louder than i expected right. 37 you know and we come out there and we find that it's you know 51 or 47 then we say well you know you didn't provide us accurate information we, we relied on information that you know we need to come back and, and, and solve this problem um so I, I think that we don't need what was nine i think that this condition you know we're, we're do you have another condition though that said that they will build the, the condition you had um, one seven? One dash seven. And we're also referencing the plans that they've submitted. Says this is what they're going to build it to. Um, and so I think that between that, that we you know, we should meet our our noise levels that we're expecting. Okay, go, going to one point nine. The <clears throat> drop. Don't we have to reference a base? The studies included in the resolution, which would be the 3740. No, I think Mr. Uh, Tuno is right that um, <coughs> we should add um, three lines. decibels or more from the baseline established with approval of yes. the permit. Ba uh, and do you have to establish what the baseline was was based on the uh, the acoustical studies? Yeah, probably we, that would be good to reference the Ballard Acoustical Consult uh, Analysis and whatever date that was. So that that becomes your your, your background uh, uh, report. Yeah. Yeah. I think that needs to be referenced in there, and somebody can you know you don't need to put the, the all the numbers there. You just need to refer to the report. So just so I'm like getting this. So if they do install the equipment and it is 38, is that going to be a problem? No. I would say no. No. Okay. What about the um, a condition regarding maintenance, well, nighttime maintenance? That's the other issue. Um, to start with, I would I would suggest that Verizon isn't going to do more maintenance than they have to. It's not like they. That's a training facility that they train people on how to how to maintain the equipment, and they're out there every night. So. And this is a, an industry that there's some history with. So what I was hoping for is is, a, is some numbers, and I think we got that from Karen, on what is typically a, um, a number of maintenance visits, if you will, to a facility like this uh, in Verizon's network. I mean, can... You've, you've mentioned that you didn't expect this to happen more than three times a year, that there would be a, a procedure under which 
the operation would have to be, uh, the maintenance work would have to be done in, in the evening time because there was going to be a shutdown, uh, uh, shutdown of service, which you want to do at night time so that it interrupts the fewest number of customers. Um, I take your word for it for now that that's a, a th a three times a year is a, is a fairly comfortable number. I, I, no, I'm not looking for a fixed number. I'm just, you know, with, with the, um, the limitation in my mind is that Verizon is not going to do it when it doesn't have to do it. And in the past, that, that happens on average for a facility like this some minimal number of times a year. Um, so I, I, don't think we, I don't think we can realistically tell them you have a, a limit on the number of maintenance visits you can make in a year because that you, they, they can't predict what's going to happen. I would agree. I mean, it's not like there's been a historical pattern of, of nighttime, disruptive nighttime activities. I think the only time was when they were repairing the tower or something, you know, some new installation. If I, there was some weird, you know, it was happening so often, I think that the homeowners would have a right to come to us and say, hey, you know, on the basis of this discussion, we think there's been some excess. Uh, I don't know what the powers of the of the, of the commission would be if, if in, in terms of making Verizon explain itself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that. Somewhere, and I'm looking at the resolution, but I don't see it in here, and I had read that there would be a 72-hour notification period mm -hmm. of night work. Condition 1-8 right there. 1-8. Okay, and with respect to that, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa, were you not done? At condition 1-8 as approved by the planning director, that's the current wording of it. It's a 72-hour notification process. Okay, so it, it, I, that's good. Thank you. With respect to the notice, what happens when the system breaks? Do they are they down for seventy two hours because no, they, they put the notice? They go in an emergency. Okay, yeah. this is for what regular they, routine, some maintenance. routine that they want to do, um, and they're going to shut down the service. Okay, and that's only when they want to do it at night. If they want to do something in the daytime, they, just go during they the can day. go. <laughs> Any further discussion? Are we ready for the recommendation? Staff recommends the Planning Commission to pass a motion to sign resolution 2016-003, denying 2015-075 appeal, subject to the findings and modified conditions of approval. Is there a motion? All motion. So second. Moved, moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. We are moving on to the Planning Commission continued hearing on the Planning Commission review and recommendation to the Board of Supervisors on the general plan update. I believe we're starting with the conservation and open space element, which is continued from February 4th, 2016. And unless I'm mistaken, I think we're on, starting on page 17 on the implementation programs, water resources, and water quality. That's correct. Didn't we have that one small item from re well, I was going to suggest do you that maybe do that we first? want to jump to that one resource, uh, resource production, the one policy, um, I believe it was policy 2.7, it's on page 6 of the resource production element. Okay. And um, my understanding is it's not so much the intent of the policy, just the way it's, it's worded that you felt was confusing. Was this your, this was your suggestion, right? Ellie? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the way it was worded didn't I'm make sorry, a lot we're of at which one? 2.7. 2.7, .7. 2.7, okay. 2.8. I don't have a 2.8. Why am I looking at a 2.7? They provided us a 
Okay, there's two different versions. The, the, the 2.8 was the the number it was before we edited it, and we eliminated one of the, the policies, so the, the final version. Same so words. So we're on 2.7. Yeah. Okay. 2.7 are those who are looking at an older version. It's 2.8. <laughs> okay. We'll call it 2.7. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's the one dealing with solar energy installations. It didn't make a lot of sense to me the way it was written. And I suggest it be revised to read solar energy installations shall be compatible with agricultural activities and such facilities shall not be located on private agricultural land and shall not reduce the production of the primary agricultural products. Any discussion of that before we ask, open the public hearing, ask for public comment? No? None. No, all right. So is there anyone in the audience that would like to talk about resource production element and the suggested revisions to 2.7? Could you reread what Kelly suggested, please? Yeah, Kelly, could you reread it? Yes. <clears throat> solar energy installations shall be compatible with agricultural activities and such facilities shall not be located on prime agricultural land and shall not reduce the production of the primary agricultural products. If you want, I can read what was there before. I agree that that's a better expression of the intent of the L of the um, component. The language before um, confused itself, I think. So is there anyone in the audience that would like to provide input on this recommended change to 2.7? No one. Okay. Um, commissioners? I already... In my my spiel. Well, sounds good. Yeah. I'm fine with it. Fine. So Different we, way of saying the same thing. So. Yes, it is. So, is there? Do we need a motion? Excuse me. I do have a comment. Okay. Okay, Bob. It, would you need to come to the podium, please? It's just to reference. A, Could you please state your name no, for the record? Bob Garamendi. Thank you. Kevin Wright's not here, but I do know that the. Um, there's some special statutes concerning Williamson Act land and the placement of solar uh, facilities. And whether it be prime land, I'm not quite sure how it reads, but there, is, there are statutes as it relates to the Williamson Act. So are you suggesting we just need to make sure that we are I, I in alignment I'm, with I'm them? I'm just bringing that to your attention, that there are state statutes that apply to Williamson Act land and the placement of solar facilities. and the cancellation of, of the Williams Act contracts, and then the addition of a solar easement contract. It it's, has its own life, and how that should be worded or... This doesn't conflict with that. I've, this doesn't doing, conflict. This does not conflict. There, is, there are provisions it under does state law. Because prime ag land here, yeah. and there's, the state statute yeah. does provide for certain facilities go in on Williamson Act land. There's a big concern at the state level of um, uh, farmers, particularly in the Central Valley, uh, due to some of the water shortages, that they're opting out of Doing growing plants and putting in, in solar farms mm -hmm. instead. Um, and the loss of prime ag land, you know, the 60 feet of loam that's down there in the valley floor, uh, we really hate to see that, you know, covered up with, um, even though it's, you know, great solar aspect, lots of sunlight, you know, you're, other than the fog in the, in the wintertime, um, but, you know, it, conflicting needs of the, of the state trying to reduce um, you know, uh, carbon emissions and using alternative energy sources at the same time protecting our, our agricultural resources. So they're grappling with that. There's a new policy document that just came out a few weeks ago um, from the Department of Conservation that talks about how one would go about, you know, <coughs> looking at particularly Williamson Act contracted land and um, solar uh, installations. I believe that we have 
the flexibility here because of the topography and the varying uh, types of soils and, and you know, production uses in the county to accommodate both. And I think it's consistent with the state's concerns uh, and I don't have a problem with, with this language. I think that the um, direction that we're heading is, you know, we, we want to promote alternative energy at the same time or we want to support alternative energy at the same time we want to support our, our ag industry. And this policy basically says that it's okay to put uh, solar insulation as long as you're not reducing the agricultural productivity of, of, the, of the land. And we would look at that when someone came in. You know, a, a small scale, you know, in, in the individual, you know, home size um, installation is not going to make a difference. When you get into the industrial level, the industry, uh, the, the um, utility scale, solar installations, we'd require a conditional use permit. And one of the things we'd have to look at would be what, to, what is its effect on agricultural production. We've got other policies here that if you're taking out ag production, we need to compensate for that somehow. So I, I think we've got it covered. Um, and I think we're consistent with state law along that. Got it. Thank you. Do we need a motion for this yes. change? Is there a motion to? All right. I move to uh, adopt the uh, 2.7 as edited. Ted, you want a second? Second. Okay. All in favor. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. So now we're over to the conservation and open space, page 17, picking up where we left off on the implementation programs, and that's water resources, water quality. Fawn, before we go there, <clears throat> I'd like to revisit briefly the open space zoning, which is at the top of that page. I'm still a little worried about that. Okay. We, we did modify it. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion back and forth with Mr. Garamandi about what the effect of this might be. And I think we modified it to read something like create open space zoning or equivalent for land dedicated to open space to preserve and or manage unique, important, or significant natural and cultural resources. Um, the way this is worded, it would create an obligation on the county to, to get this done. I'm not so sure this is going to be a simple thing to draft um, to avoid the issues that Mr. Garamandi raised. He, there was concern about property winding up in this open space zoning category somewhat involuntarily. And we, tr we tried to limit it, I think, at one point by bringing back in the original language, the unique, important, or significant natural or cultural resources. But, I, I, you, you know, some would say that all land is unique. No one piece of land is the same as any other piece of land. Um, natural, it seems to me, could refer to anything that's undeveloped. And so I am concerned about an obligation to do this without seeing what this ordinance would, would look like. And I, I'm assuming the county could create open space zoning whether or not the general plan requires it to do so. And I think I would be more comfortable doing either one of two things, which is just not have this in here. Uh, on the theory the county can go ahead and do it if it wants to, or anticipating the concern that it'll fall through the cracks if there's nothing here about it. Uh, changing it slightly to say, just consider creating, et cetera, because we've done that on other things. And that way, if it turns out that this just, just won't work, it, there's no way to draft it to, to satisfy everybody or in a way that's satisfactory, then we haven't violated the general plan. Um, that's, that's what I was worried about. And Peter, do you have some thoughts on Kelly's concern about it not being a simple, simple thing to draft and that it could be basically involuntarily applied to someone's property? Um, he's correct. 
uh, that it's not going to be a simple thing to draft. It'll be part of a new zoning ordinance that we'll, you know, we intend to do once we um, adopt the general plan. One of the first tasks will then be to um, bring the zoning code into compliance with the general plan. Uh, our code is outdated. It needs a comprehensive uh, rewrite, um, and that would be a, uh, a challenging task. Um, you're saying this would be a simple? No, it would not be simple. Uh, it, it would be part of a larger uh, task of you know, revising our zoning code, um, the, the language of the code itself, to um, you know, update it. It's 30 years old and it's you know, badly in need of, of um, a fixing in many, many cases. Um, any, any zoning ordinance update is going to go through you know lengthy review hearing process um, and so you know the concerns about it being uh, applied unilaterally by the county you know is um, it, it's um, you know, everyone will have a say about that in, in the process it's 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 not the intent of it um, and I think that maybe the consider language that you suggest is something that says it's something that it's a tool in the toolbox we could use. We may decide we don't want to use it and we don't do it, but we certainly want to identify it as something that, you know, that we could consider as, as we update our zoning code. I like the addition of consider for the reasons that Mr. Wooster brought up. Uh, can I, I take a step back and, and ask for kind of an explanation of what this proposed uh, zoning district would accomplish that isn't otherwise um, addressed or uh, uh, accomplished elsewhere in the general plan? What what new what what's the purpose of this new tool? That's you don't already have a tool for it. It's really more, and you know, that we added I think the phrase the means to identify lands. Um, it's an identification tool, and so as um, we, you know, as, as lands are set aside for certain purposes for open space, uh, protection of, of managing unique, important, or significant natural cultural resources, then we identify what those are. <coughs> and there's zoned open space so that someone coming in, you know, later on say, oh, you know, this is, you know, for either because I want to go find out where all these, you know, neat sites are, or gee, I'm not going to go bother trying to buy that piece of property to develop it because it's owned open space. There's obviously something there that's going to make it difficult to develop. Um, rather than have to rely on other resources or information that may not be quite so readily available to someone looking at the zoning map. That, to me, is the purpose of it, in a, in a nutshell. So when it comes to the, the cultural example, that you, mm -hmm. that's not already addressed in the other section of the general plan where we're dealing with cultural resources? Well, <coughs> it's a... It, it's a, a tool to implement that. So we, we say we're going to protect cultural resources, we want to avoid it. Um, once it's avoided, and, and particularly with cultural resources, you don't necessarily want to advertise that they're out there. You know, this is a cultural resource, so it's sometimes hard to, to get the information to know where that, where that is. Uh, you don't want looters going there and, and destroying things, for, for example. Um, by selling an open space, we said, Okay, that's been set aside. That's, that's not going to be developed. Um, and it's, it's something that we've you know, worked with the landowner or the landowners worked with uh, some other agency or, or entity to establish that open space. Um, and then just sort of, okay, off limits for development, essentially what it, what it says. I think one example that was brought up earlier was when you have clustering, and it was just an example, where the land that would not be developed would might fall into an open space zoning the issue was then raised when was that when that happened and the answer was well normally say you were in ag one or or uh, ag preserve you would keep your existing zoning normally i mm -hmm. think that was a concern mr garamani yeah. brought up and that's why we brought in the back in the unique, important, or significant language. This mm -hmm. is kind of a limitation. My concern is I'm not sure that really does it. I don't know. 
And the more I thought about it, the more I got worried that this is really going to be a, a difficult thing to, to write this ordinance so that it actually does work. And that's why I've just, I thought, why commit to something that might turn out to be a real bear mm -hmm. <laughs> to deal with? Yeah. Rather than it's, and I'm happy with the placeholder language says we really ought to consider this because I don't have a problem with the concept. I, I think it could be a useful tool. The devil just may be in the details to the extent that it may overwhelm the usefulness of the concept. They definitely will be in the details. <laughs> the, the devil will be. Um, yeah, I think we got a little sidetracked on the, the clustering discussion last time. Um, and, and that may not be the most appropriate use for that because in some cases, particularly with agriculture, you're going to keep it in agricultural mm -hmm. production. So uh, uh, ag zoning would be more appropriate in that situation uh, than an open space zone. Um, well, I'm well, sorry. Well, there, there's so many, I mean, not just ag and not just, um, there were other areas of open space, rather it be a developer and then he's setting aside this open space over here. There were so many different types of open space that having a zone created for it was going to make identification easier. I see so many benefits to this. I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but I really think having the benefit of having a zone identifying the open space, because like you said, you know, if someone's going to look at selling that or doing something with it, th this makes it easier to identify where those open spaces are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of, I, I like having the zone. I, I see what your concerns are, but I, is there another way that we can there isn't. It would have to be in that zone to make it clear. And again, this is, um, you know, it says this is what we intend to do. And as we get into that, the details of that, we'll be grappling with, with all that minutia of how is this going to work and what's it really do and where is it applied. Um, so I think that just by having it in here, it is in a way sort of a placeholder. It's something to consider. Uh, it says our intent that we're going to, you know, we want to identify those open space areas. We want to make sure that they're um, you know, identified and um, that that's a tool we'll, that we'll consider using. So changing the word to consider is what? Consider creating an open yes. space zone. I think that. Um, just in the process of this, um, just at, when we're going through this and all the different elements and we talk about we're going to create an ordinance or we're going to create um, you know, zones, whatever we're going to do in the future, in the, and we have all these placeholders and the elements, when does that process get done? Before it goes through EIR review or when it comes back? Does it get done so, and then go? When so does that once the plan is adopted, the next step is, then, okay, now we're going to start implementing this thing. So we've adopted the plan. The first step would be then to take all these measures and prioritize them and figure out what, what's it going to take to do this. And the board's going to say, uh, Mr. Maller, um, here's what I, we want you to do. Set your you know, budget, your staffing, and your resources to make sure this is the number one thing we do. And here's our list of the top 10 or so. And I'm going to have to come back and say, here's what it's going to take to do these things. Um, it's not all going to be done the first few years. It's going to take some time to do all There's a lot of things in here. Um, but that's after, that's after adoption, after EIR, after adoption, so this stuff yeah. does not get done before, so we're talking three years down the road. It, it, it can't get done before. We, we, will, okay. we will never adopt a general plan if that's the case. I mean, the, the plan says here's what we intend to do in the future. Over well, the next 20 years, we're going to implement these things. Some of these are more critical, and as we work through the EIR, we'll find out some of those are going to be more critical from an environmental perspective and may raise you know, to the top of the, of the list. Others are going to be, you know, and, and each year I will go back to the board as we have budget discussions and say, here are the things we said we're going to do. Here are the priorities you gave me last year. Here's how we've progressed um, on a fairly regular basis every couple of years. I'd like to go back to the board and, and look at, you know, the assumptions we made on um, population growth and where, where we expect people to be moving to. Uh, if that changes dramatically, we may need to tweak the plan a little bit. We may need to say that, see, we need to um, look at some other implementation measure has raised to the top of the, of the list as something we need to get done right away. It's, a, it's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. You know, the year before, it might not have been so, so critical. So those are the kind of things we'll have to be looking at 
annually to say, you know, how are we going to implement this plan? And it's going to be implemented over the life of the plan, really. There may be some things that don't get done for 10 years or more, just because we just don't have the resources and time, and it's not of such a high level priority that we can get to it right then. I think it's an important tool, uh, but I would be fine with adding consider. Me too. Okay. So, shall we move on or should we take public comment on just this change? You know, we made some pretty drastic changes I'd like to hear from the public. On just open, open space, space, zoning okay. district. Just on that one item? Yes. That and there was one other. What oh, the... Uh, 2.7? 2.7? Well, we already did 2.7. Yeah, yeah, we did. No, 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 yeah, we did. no, no, no we comment. Did. We talked oh, about... Oh, we did. Bob yeah. got it. That's yeah. right. <coughs> Never mind. So maybe let's ask for public comment on the suggested revision to COSA, which is Open Space Zoning District. Good morning. Vicki Reinke, Calaveras County Republicans. Um, this section has been a bother to, to me for ever since I read it. We've had a little bit of discussion in the past on it, so I might be repeating some of the things I've mentioned, but when I read open space zoning district, that to me means that we're going to, as a county, decide where open space is going to be. We're going to be deciding this, and, and maybe I'm wrong, so that's why, um, that we're going to decide this ahead of time so property owners and developers are told where they can't build because it's open space. And we're doing this to private property unless we own that property. So that bothers me. It bothers me to say who decides about this open space. I know I've mentioned that before because, you know, maybe as somebody's coming in to make a development and they have their property, then that discussion can happen because we all believe that we should be a rural county and that there should be some space left after a development. But to predetermine what those areas are is what I'm reading this to be. And it just seems so wrong in my mind that we would do this ahead of time and tell people where they can and can't build something because you've determined it to be open space. Um, it, it just reeks of taking property away from people. And then if we do this, are we going to compensate landowners for this? Because to me, it's a taking when you decide somebody can't do something to their property in a certain area. So anyway, those are just my comments. I just feel very strongly about this because just reading it, right, I don't have all the expertise, but that's how I read this and feel about that piece. So I hope you'll take caution while you decide on that particular um, item. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Muriel Zeller, Valley Springs. I don't have the California government code uh, relevant section with me. But I believe an open space zoning district is required by the California government code as part of a comprehensive open space preservation plan, which should be contained within the open space element. So you may want to um, look into that. Thank you. Uh, Colleen Platt from Valley Springs. Maybe I un misunderstood, but I didn't. As I would be concerned if, as Vicki is, if things would be predetermined, but my understanding is that's not the purpose of this zoning district, that it's you know, when you go in and do a developed, these things are discovered at that point, then, oh, here we have an archaeological site and here we have a wetlands. And so we decide at that point in our project development that we're going to put those things in open space, right? I mean, we're not just going and blanketing. Well, no, that was my understanding. Yeah, we're not and blanketing. It, it's voluntary, and, the, and, right. and right now I think we're really discussing the uh, conceptually right. that this district would be uh, a good tool. A good tool to identify. And yeah. what, the way mm -hmm. we've 
revised suggested revision is that we would consider that this would be a good tool upon mm -hmm. further investigation mm -hmm. and then actual you know getting into the nuts and bolts of about how it might be implemented exactly yeah but I mean it wouldn't be you know blanket no, to wouldn't. something that's not already right. there if we have in fact like we do have existing conservation right. easements on land in the county and these could possibly fit into that right. open space it wouldn't be zone like district. we're going to slap a open space zone on your um, property exactly calling. that's yeah. that's what i'm trying to <laughs> right. clar clarify right. yeah that's Thank my you. understanding as well but again that would be worked out right. and you know the details later but just right. conceptually we're saying we think it might right. be a good tool for us right so all of this would come back to the public yes. down the future yes three years down the road and then Through discuss the zoning it. ordinance all yes. that right right well, <clears throat> we did change the language from what's shown on the original draft. Yes, we Mr. have. Mr. Maurer came up with the correct language. Yeah, and maybe what we'll, we'll review that with this latest edition of the Consider. So I, I'm reading it now, and I'm seeing what everybody out there is saying. When I, I'm, you were in public comment, and I don't want to interrupt if there was more. Well, let's see, let's, let's just wait. Is there anyone else? Okay. We're coming back to the commission. Go ahead. Okay, um, I think when, when as a tool, as a means to identify, maybe what we need to be saying is properties that have already been identified to give them the zone versus identifying more because it's not clear enough. And I think that the way that I thought we were dealing with this was putting it into a zone. Well, I think it's, it's there a means to identify lands which have been dedicated to open space purposes. Have <laughs> been dedicated, I don't have that language. Let's so speak, let me changed read, it. read the whole thing. Okay. Consider creating an open space zone or equivalent as a means to identify lands which have been dedicated to open space purposes for managing unique, important, or significant natural or cultural resources. Right. That's better. Right. I'm good. Then I'm looking at my old one too. Okay. Can you give me that reading one more time, please? Consider creating an open space zone or equivalent as a means to identify lands which have been dedicated to open space purposes for managing unique, important, or significant natural or cultural and cultural resources. Are we good? Yes. So is there a, I guess we need a motion to? I'll motion. I'll second that. Moved and seconded to revise the open space zone district description, COS. Dash A. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Okay, so for the third time's a charm. <laughs> Water resources, and unless you want a short break. I wouldn't mind one. So to 1045, we'll have a short recess. Well, don't take one on my account. If, uh, no, I don't know. That's good. <laughs> Would you guys like one? I could use one. Yeah, okay. All right, 1040, 1045 sharp. We'll be back. Thank you. We are um, back in session, and we are going to be starting with water resources, water quality implementation programs. Any who wants to launch in suggestions? Are, are we good with stormwater management standards? And Just a second here. I've got to find my place. Page 17. Yeah, but I'm need on my note page. Just a second here. One A. No, I don't have. Uh, I didn't have any notes. Yeah, isn't that pretty well covered by the stormwater prevention plan? Oh, I did have a note on one A and B. Um, it looks to me like 1A is, is a component of 1B. But I don't know that it's worth wordsmithing the whole thing around to include it as a component of, of 1B. Um, I just wondered why it was separate because it looks like, like I say, when you're talking about grading, drainage, and erosion control, Part of that is storm water management standards, but maybe you feel like it needs to be separated out. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I think that 1A is a little more focused on storm water and flood hazards. 
while the uh, 1B is more specific as far as the Building. updating the uh, design manual and for sort of normal erosion and runoff issues to um, I'm satisfied with that, and I have no other notes on that section. Okay. On that section, so all, we're good with um, water resources, water quality implementation programs? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, look, don't keep us in suspense, Kelly. Uh, 1A, I don't have any issue with. 1B, I have some questions about. Apparently, we have an existing design manual for grading, drainage, and erosion control. What, what, what's the effect of having that? Is that a mandatory uh, set of rules or a set of guidelines? How, how does it work now? Those are the, the standards that um, developers, engineers that are working on you know, new subdivisions or any other project where there is uh, grading um, uh, activity going on, those are the standards that they, that the county reviews their plans against. So, you know, talks, and, and it's beyond my, you know, I don't have an engineering degree, so I don't really understand all the, the technical details of it. So that's um, like a public manual that we would it's give a, It's adopted to... by the county by resolution. Mm -hmm. um, it was last adopted, uh, amended in um, January, uh, no, December 2012. Um, and can be amended as, as um, new engineering design is you know, developed and, and uh, you know, grading and erosion measures are, are identified at, or are effective at, at reducing uh, erosion. So it effectively tells um, developers whatever the, these are our, these are what we would, these are our expectations, these are our standards mm -hmm. that you need to, to comply with as you go through with your project regarding stormwater or, or uh, grading drainage and erosion control. So it, 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 it's adopted by the Board of Supervisors, yes. is that correct? Yes. So it has the effect of an ordinance? Yes. So w what is the reason for amending the county code to incorporate parts of it? Um, I'm not sure. I, mean, I, I just don't understand yeah. why we're doing this. Um, I think I'd have to defer to Public Works on that question. Um, and I don't know. My experience is that the design manual has pretty much the same level of um, authority. Uh, there are um, variances or design modifications that you can request, and if it makes sense engineering wise, you know, there's always unique circumstances that. In certain, you know, due to whatever soil type or rock feature that you're in, that maybe that typical engineering, standard engineering uh, design doesn't work, and if the engineer can demonstrate that an alternative design would work, um, but if that were the case, though, if you if you then took part of that manual and incorporated it into an ordinance, it would take a a revision of the ordinance to change anything, mm -hmm. and I'm not understanding why that's a good idea. You know what I would um, suggest at this point is there's a number of changes that we've already identified that I'll need to bring back to you on this. Let me double check with um, mm -hmm. Public Works. Um, this was you know, some language that was in the draft that I began working with. I assumed that you know, those who had worked on it before had you know, parsed that and you know, said yeah, this is what needs to be done. I don't know. I don't know the reason for that. So let me check with um, uh, Robert or others in Public Works Department to see what's the purpose of this. There, there may be a really good reason to do that, and it may just be something that you know is. It, it may need to be re rewarded. So let, let me um, review this with them. Well, and the other question that. too. I mean, then <coughs> Kelly brings this up as portions. You know, it's like, well, what portions even? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no yes. <particular>. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and, and consistent with that. The grading ordinance now addresses those same issues, does it not? Drainage, erosion, et cetera, great. Okay, it does that. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is, is suggesting that it, it needs to be updated, and by updating it, they mean plop in design manual 
uh, components to it? Well, and what it, I read is that since the design manual was upgraded and <coughs> was readopted or in 2012, chances are How far it's, off could it be? Well, I mean that it is more, it, it's likely that it's more, you know, up to date, date than oh, the zoning. Oh, the design ordinance was, was 2012. Mm -hmm. So okay. it could be that mm -hmm. it is and much it, more it, accurate. It may be nothing more than referencing the design manual right. that needs to be in, in the grading, uh, in the, the grading ordinance. Well, I, I like your suggestion mm -hmm. about checking back yeah, with Public too. Works to find out what, you know, sort of where this came from and what the, and, and you know, what the impetus is. Oh, are you good with that, you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah? Yes. Okay. All right. So other Thank comments? You, COS? Yeah, that was a good catch. Well, I'm, I'm on 1C, stream and wetland setback guidelines, <coughs> where we would adopt standard building and or clearing setbacks for intermittent and perennial streams. And it goes on. And wetlands meeting U.S. Army Corps of Engineers definitions. Uh, I guess my first question is, why do we need this in a general plan? But on the merits of the thing, it's, you know, intermittent and perennial streams there's lots of them and they vary a lot in terms of the topography around them. Some are real steep canyons and some are flatter ground. And this sounds like we're gonna have a one size fits all standing building or setback for all of these. And then I don't know what a clearing setback is. I mean, I just don't know what it is. And then we get to wetlands Meeting U.S. Army Corps of Engineers definition. My understanding is there is a substantial controversy about a new rule put out by the Corps of Engineers and the EPA, which would expand the definition of waters of the United States in the view of some radically to include every ditch and puddle. And my understanding is that rule, which has been finalized, has been enjoined by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals temporarily. And nobody knows what's going to happen to it. I do not think the county ought to be in the business of siding with the Corps of Engineers on this issue. And whatever comes out of that process on the federal level, everybody will have to live with. I don't know why the county needs to get involved with coming up with standards for building and clearing setbacks for whatever turns out to be wetlands. And so I'm not clear why we're doing any of this, quite frankly. Um, Mr. Wooster brings up a very good point. I'm glad he did. If the Corps of Engineers has a definition that passes muster with the court. It doesn't mean, does it, that the county has to adopt that definition. <coughs> so if there's a fight over a wetland and a property owner, the, the, the Corps of Engineers and the property owner are in conflict with one another, That's one thing, but what if we adopt it? If we adopt the Army Corps of Engineers standards, then we're, then we're in, in bed with the Army Corps uh, on a matter that we we might find ourselves uh, regretting. Um, and I think it's possible that the issue that the uh, legal issue that Kelly Wooster brought up um, emanates from the Idaho case, and I wish I could remember the name of the plaintiff in that one. Uh, do you recall the one? No, these are, this was a case brought, if I recall correctly, by 13 states against the federal government, and it's pending in the Sixth Circuit, Federal Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And originally the government argued that the injunction applied only to those 13 states, and no, it applies across the country now. So it is a substantial controversy. There have been efforts in Congress to overturn it, which have not succeeded. And 
I don't know why the county gets involved in this. I mean, whatever comes out of it on the federal level, everybody's going to have to live with. So the reason the county would be involved, the reason why this measure is here, it's implementing policy 1.2, which it says to protect the county's surface and groundwater resources and watersheds from uses that could adversely impact water quality. Um, the reason why the county would, would have standards set forth is that um, one is so that when developers come in, they know how to design a project to avoid impact to water quality. Um, and typically there are varying widths of setback uh, so that the vegetation along stream sides isn't um, taken away and there's got more erosion. Um, and the reason why we would normally try to coordinate our efforts with the Corps of Engineers is that they're going to have to get a Corps permit. And getting a 404 permit is sometimes a multi-year process. If we can say, here's what you need to do to avoid wetland impacts, then you don't need a Corps of Engineers permit and you can go through the process more quickly. Uh, if we're going to rely solely on an applicant to deal with the Corps, then you know, we'll still, they, they still have to do that. Um, and our environmental review process becomes more lengthy and more, more complicated because now, say, okay, you need to go and bring your Corps permit to us to ensure that you're not you know, violating or you're not impacting wetland resources, something we have to look at in CEQA. And so if we can say, you meet our standard, um, then, you know, there's no mitigation. They still need to get a core permit if they're, if they're proposing to impact a wetland. They'll still need to get a core permit. Um, but if we can say, hey, here's the standard so you don't need to get one, that would be the benefit as well as the benefit to the water resources. You just confused me. They do or they don't need to get a core permit, regardless of what we put in our... Um, if they're impacting wetlands, as defined by the core, then they need to get a, a permit. So what benefit are we permit. giving them? By identifying our standards for this is um, avoidance of impacts. If you do these, you know, if, if you avoid, if you're set back a certain distance from the stream or from the wetland, then clearly it's no avoidance and clearly you're not impacting the wetland. So when we go through our CEQA checklist, we can say no impact or less than significant impact. Um, and that saves them a three-year process with the four? I, I have experienced that before where we get hung up trying to get a core answer to a project. Now, sometimes a project has to go through you know, do stream crossings or they're proposing to impact a wetland and they're still going to have to get that permit, but we can reduce the level of analysis to just that area. You know, the rest of the area where they've avoided it is, is um, you know, determined to be okay. So the benefit is... And, and so usually then that becomes a condition of approval that we identify there's going to be an impact um, and you're going to have to get a core permit. Uh, so. You get your tandem map approval, but before you can record the final map, you need to you know, can't give us a copy of the core permit to show that you've satisfied their needs. Typically, though, what happens is that they, along with the Department of Water, State Department of Water Resources or Department of Fish and Game, say, well, we need to look at that to identify what the mitigation measures are going to be. And so it gets much more com uh, complicated. Um, it's complicated regardless, um, but the purpose, again, for having county standards is that if someone is trying to design their project to avoid impacts, to minimize the amount of time and minimize the conflict that they're going to have on their project, they know what our standards are. And we're going to Versus that. the opposite would be not having identified what the core standards are. They go through their process. They, you know, we don't say anything about what the core is going to be looking at them regarding, and they go through the whole process, and then they end up having to get the 404 permit and redesign the project or go for the permit, it just kind of gives them a head up, heads up like um, in advance, so to yeah. speak. Well, it's a, you know, the purpose again is for the county to identify what our mitigation is going to be, or our threshold for impact. So if, you're, if, you're, if we've got a 20-foot setback from an you know, intermittent stream and they're proposing to grade up to 10 feet, then we'll say, well, there's potential impact. We'll have to look more closely. Maybe that because of the topography, the vegetation, you know, uh, encroaching 10 feet 
is okay. You know, maybe there's a you know, clear defined channel and I, I've, I've seen that on, on a number of projects where um, the you know, biological analysis that's required of a project says well, we're proposing you know, encroachment into that standard setback but here's the reason why it's not going to adversely affect this stream and uh, the biologist will then identify that. But otherwise, you don't, if you can just say, hey, we're meeting the standards, then they don't need to go through that extra effort of, of sort of showing why a closer impact of the stream is not going to adversely affect it. So we're not saying in here that we are adopting the U.S. Army Corps engineers' definitions. We're saying we're going to adopt a standard for our own building and clearing setbacks. Mm -hmm. No. That would meet whatever the standard is of the Corps of Engineers because we're going to have to meet it anyway. But I don't see where it's well, states. and, and may, maybe the, the the phrase and wetlands meeting that it maybe is defined because there's a lot of debate over what a wetland is, uh, and that that's and so that. maybe the term wetland is defined by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Well, how about this? That's the problem. Um, adopt standards for intermittent uh, perennial streams and wetlands that meet all applicable state and federal standards, however they might shake out at that level. I, I think I just must be dense today. No. I, I'm, I'm not getting this. Um, is, is there, if the county had standards for setbacks for wetlands, whatever they are, mm -hmm and an applicant complies with those standards, however that happens. Or is there a suggestion that the Corps of Engineers will look at that and say, well, the county's already passed on this, we'll just not worry no, about no, it? No. Um, what we're saying is that our standards, I think the language that um, Commissioner Tuno suggested maybe better reflects the intent here. The standards we adopt will protect the resource uh, to the same level as the, the core requirements. And so if we say, okay, this is an identified wetland, the wetland as defined by the Army Corps of if you disturb this area, you're going to have to get a 404 permit. Our standard would be you avoid that. You're, you're set back a certain distance so you're not impacting that wetland. If you can design your project that way, you don't need a core permit because you've avoided it. And this is what avoidance means as far as we're concerned. Well, wouldn't that, though, go back to what the federal standards are? In other words, it sounds like this is just an informational thing where the county says, here's, here's some rules, and we think if you comply with them, you will mitigate matters such that the Corps won't require a permit. We might be wrong about that. Uh, yes, they're right. No, I don't think so. But I still don't understand the benefit of this. If, Either the core is going to require a permit or it's not, depending on its standards. That's true. And nothing we put into a, in the guidelines or whatever we want to call these things is going to change that. And I, I have to say it just sounds to me like another layer of regulation on top of what the feds are already going to require. And I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing a benefit here. If I understand it right, and I'm not saying I do, but what this suggests, what Mr. Maurer is trying to convey is that if we adopt a standard that addresses federal and state requirements, which we will, presumably we have to do, the standard that you're going to, you're going to build, you're going to include these standards, but we become, we become the, the entity that passes judgment on the plan, gives the property owner the tools to mitigate according to what we think would work. At the end of the day, which is the phrase that we're supposed to be not using anymore, um, the core can disagree with us, the EPA, you know, the can disagree, can disagree with us. They can all disagree with us if they want to, but the property owner at least goes into it with some confidence that he's met, some, met the requirements and can avoid that. We don't have control over those federal entities, but 
we've we've given the property owner the best shot at at compliance. No, I, I think it actually goes beyond that, and I think maybe what where we got thrown off here was the phrase "meeting U.S. Army Corps of Engineers definition." I think that um, what we're saying is that this is essentially a mitigation measure for impacts that future development will have on stream and wetland resources in the county. Um, this is something that will be pointed out in the EIR for the general plan that as we develop in the county, if we, you know, there will be potential impacts to water quality um, by potential development within the stream zones and wetland areas. And so to mitigate that, you identify where those are and one of the tools is um, we look at the USGS topo maps, what we do today, and if there's a blue line stream on the map, that's a threshold. You've got a, and, and it could be intermittent stream or perennial stream, and depending on the type, there's a certain setback that's established. And so development designs around that. Um, and we also, I also included, I added that phrase, in, and wetlands in there, because that's also something that we will have to look at. That will be a potential impact of future development uh, in the county. And the best way to minimize that impact is avoidance uh, and creating a buffer around that so that the runoff from development you know, just doesn't all go right into it. That there's the vegetation around it that serves as uh, um, a filter for pollutants and water runoff into streams and wetlands. Um, so what this is is intended to provide mitigation for future development based on the amount of development that we're allowing from our land use map. We're saying we're going to you know, accommodate another you know, 40,000 people in the county. And that's, that's going to create you know, the need for more roads, more houses, more businesses. That's all going to have an environmental effect that we'll need to identify in our EIR and come up with the means to mitigate if we can. This is essentially the, the future mitigation for that impact. Um, the, what I was trying to get at with the reference to the Army Corps is that they have a definition of wetlands. And that is a standard that we can use to define whether or not, you know, our, um, our analysis, our review of a project, you know, is, is it a, a wetland as defined by the federal government? Um, and I can, that's the issue, that's the concern you have, is that we're saying this is, if, if the feds say it's a wetland, and you know, whatever the result of the court case is, we will come up with a definition of what a wetland is. Um, a developer is gonna have to deal with it. And if someone says, we've avoided it, whatever that final definition is, then the, the path is easier. It's, it's smoother, it, it protects the resource, and the developer can move through the process much more easily than sort of this unknown of having to, well, let's go to the federal government and, and you know, when a, a subdivision is submitted to us, they will identify where those resources are. And it's a, typically it's prepared, there's a biological analysis done, and here are the streams, and here are the wetlands, and here's the, the, the rare plants, and whatever else is out there, and here's where we've avoided, or here's where we're going to impact it. If it's an impact, they've got to go through the whole permit process. So let me ask you a question about those maps that you're talking about. Are those maps anywhere related to the FEMA maps that the federal government gave us that were completely no. wrong? No. They're not completely They're not. separate maps. They it's wouldn't have any waterways maps. affecting and crossing over. The, the flood zone designations are completely different. Okay, because this is bringing in, um, when I'm reading this over and over again, it's bringing in intermittent and per perennial streams, and that is some of the same things in the FEMA maps that were identified as flood zones when they weren't at all. But those intermittent and perennial streams are kind of an issue. So are you, you're not gonna, because I, when you started talking about that and you really started hitting on those maps, all I could think of was FEMA and the fight we've had with them. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made me nervous <laughs> when you went that yeah. direction. Um, we don't have any building and clearing setbacks now? Yeah, we do. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there are, there are septic setbacks. Mm -hmm. There are setbacks for wells and septic areas. And, and, uh, but as development comes in, 
we sort of on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. you know, we, you're just not supposed to negatively impact it, mm -hmm. or we have to decide: is it an impact? Uh, and if so, then what's the mitigation? Uh, or is it so significant that it, it can't be mitigated? They're still going to have to go to the Army Corps of Engineers in, in their EIR. It's going to pick it up no matter how we place this in here as a placeholder. It's no, kind I, of hard to see if we set a setback. Yeah. If they're going to stay mm -hmm. within what would be considered a state or federal adopted mm -hmm. standard anyway, so that standard could change over time. Absolutely. If, if we say the setback for a wetland area is 20 feet from the edge of the wetland. So when a project comes in and the biologists say, here's the wetland area, and that's based on the current standard, whatever it may be, for wetland definition. And there's based on soil type and hydrology and vegetation, there's, you can map a wetland area. Um, and if that changes based on new core or EPA rules and they're bigger or smaller, that will be what's applied at that point in time. What we establish is how much you need to set back from that. Um, and we look at sort of the biological impact of, you know, do you build right up to it? Do they need to be, you know, how far away? You know, the bigger stream, the bigger the setback is um, because of the potential for, you know, more in, you know, greater impact. I just have concerns. I look at the Cottage Springs project and they got a <coughs> wetland <laughs> and there is just a puddle of water there, but they have this huge area of land that they're not going near and it just doesn't make any sense how they're defining a wetland. I mean, I can see River Creek's waters running into it. I, I get that, but their identification of wetlands doesn't make sense to me and who comes up with a puddle of water making it a wetland spot. I guess because there could be a frog in it. Well, it's, you know, the, the whole, um, I won't get into a discussion of the biological importance of wetlands for, you know, filtering water quality and the biological diversity and all that. But, you know, that's, I get that part. That's, you know, through the, you know, course of the last several decades, it's been identified that wetlands are important. And we have to address them in any project and, and to the degree possible, protect them. Uh, it's part of the CEQA process. It's part of the uh, you know, whole project review process. How do we move this forward? Um, are you, I may have misheard you, but would the standard building in or clearing setbacks, would they wouldn't really be one size fit all, would they? They would vary according to the topography and the stream and whether right. it's rocky. And so it would be a series of standards. True. Is, is there a real advantage to doing it that way? Because it sounds like it's it's going to have to be quite detailed, and it's going to change a lot depending upon what you're faced with. Is there a real advantage to doing that as opposed to just taking it as it comes? When somebody comes in and wants to do something, you look at it and say, well, here's what we have. This is going to be your setback. I mean, I, I don't know. I just asked the question. Um, yes, I think there would be. It, it, again, it's it's. So the, the developer knows up front what's required, um, and it streamlines the process. Now, the last sentence of that, standards may contain a provision for reduction of setback uh, on qualified biology recommendation. So if the standard setback is, say, you know, 20 feet, but because of the unique topography, whatever, 10 feet provides sufficient um, protection of that water, water resource, then on a project by project basis, we can look at that. But there's sort of, it's, it's not quite so um, specific as to, you know, every single soil type, every single rock type. But, you know, there are you know, different types of streams. And this type of stream is going to have this setback. You know, the larger stream is going to have a little greater setback. Um, so there may be half a dozen or so different setbacks established for the type of stream that we can identify fairly, fairly easily without going through uh, a a lengthy biological analysis. So it's something that rather than having to hire a biologist to prepare, the surveyor engineer can just say, well, there's the stream and there's my setback. I meet it. I can avoid this extra cost and extra time in going through this process. If I want to encroach in that area, then we got to bring in the specialist to look at, well, see, you know, you notice that because of unique circumstances that wetland really doesn't extend or that stream zone doesn't extend you know 10 or 20 feet from the 
um, the center of the stream. It only, you know, it's only five feet. So that's where sort of the, the specialization comes into, into play. Maybe we ought to hear from the public at some point. Could I um, suggest something first? Well, okay. maybe, <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead. I, I've got some language change. I don't know if that's substantive, but based upon the, the discussion that's come forth, I can offer it or we can wait. Well, I think I'd like to keep this discussion open, but actually see if there's any comments on COS 1E so that we could take comment on the whole water resources and water quality section. Because it doesn't seem like E is very controversial. I don't have anything on E. I don't either. So that way we can conclude this section and take comments on it. Um, Did, yeah. Okay. This is the last comment on, on um, uh, implementation measures for water? Yes. Okay. Then, um, then maybe, maybe it would be, maybe if I offered my language and I have a question too. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. And then I, I do have a comment too, but let's do that and then we'll open this section up for public comment. Okay. Yeah. okay. So it, <clears throat> Mr. Morris has told us that this, these are mitigation measures that we're <coughs> suggesting here. So, and, I, and again, I don't know that this substantively changes anything, but I'm going to say it anyway. The language would read, adopt mitigation measures that address applicable state and federal requirements regarding intermittent and perennial streams and wetlands. That would be sentence one. And I have an issue with sentence two, but digesting that first one, My comment, it doesn't really inform the developer about what those mm -hmm. are. I mean, I, I'm in agreement with Mr. Maurer that any time we can tell someone up front, sort of, you know, this is our, these are our requirements for building near wetlands. That's my uh, intent. Well, and I think that's important, but adopting mitigation measures doesn't tell them what those guidelines are. It doesn't tell them, like, if it's a, you know, a, a perennial stream or, or an annual, you know, that, that it's 100 feet you know, generally speaking, or 200 feet, or if it's a, uh, a wetland, that it's well, 300 feet. If you go into your mitigation measures and you look at those issues, I think that's where you get those kinds of details. I don't, um, is, yeah, I, I, I don't I think that it. really gets to where I was trying to get with this measure um, and what would the original drafters of it um, had come up with, um, that what we really, because to me, mitigation measures are more of a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I said that this would be, this is a mitigation to impacts of the general plan on water resources. Um, I, we will have to address this in some way through the EIR. Um, and <coughs> I, this is a fairly standard practice of, of jurisdictions to adopt standards as a, as a means to mitigate those impacts. Okay. Let me go on to my issue with the second sentence. Would the reduction in setback necessarily have to be based upon um, a consultant's report, in this case a biologist? Typically they are. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a way that you would reduce, I mean, the, the establishment of the setback itself is going to be something that's uh, developed by the county working with uh, an expert in water quality or biology to um, establish what that is, what makes sense, given the, the topography and the type of streams we have here um, and the, the resources that we're trying to protect. Um, the, the well, let me give you an example. If a developer came and said, look, okay, uh, here's the problems. Here's my solution to those problems. Can the county say, yeah, we like that, or we're not sure about that. Give us a qualified biologist's opinion on that. Can, can you avoid that process if it's clear to the county in the county's eyes that, that that's an appropriate mitigation? My, the county's not the expert, though. Yeah. Well, um, but the, 
the county is supposed to have the expertise enough to make a standard, the county then should have the expertise to, to know whether the offered mitigation is, um, is appropriate. Well, this would be, the, 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 the biologist's recommendation would be based on if you want to have a reduction in the standard, it's just like, you know, it's asking for something special, like, a, you know, like if, it, it, um, to, if it's 100 feet, saying 50 feet, and I don't think you could say, well, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I really, I don't see any critters out there. There's nothing going on. You would need to have a, a professional's opinion. Now, I don't know. I would be qualified. I don't know my right. staff would be qualified to say, yeah, that's okay. Because right. again, this, the standards not just going to be pulled out of, of thin air. It's going to be developed based on recommendations from a biologist and hydrologist and you know, other you know, experts. So to write these standards, we would have to hire a bunch of experts to yes. ka-ching. Yeah. Let me give you an example of, and that is, sometimes there's some engineering mm -hmm. uh, that has to come into it, not just biological. Right. And uh, a good example was Paws out here with their elephant sanctuary. Uh, there was some considerable complaint because they're, they couldn't do anything within, say, 20 feet of the high water mark. And if you went to beyond about 18 feet, you were on the side of a cliff. And they were putting in a fence. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who were against this made a big issue of the fact that they were encroaching on the, on the, on the river. And it was, so they finally didn't have to put the Well, that would be the, the circumstance cliff. where we would say, OK, if, if we need to encroach because of physical constraints, or design yeah. criteria that we're trying to, to meet that don't allow us to meet that standard. Then we could say, okay, what's, what's the impact from a biological standpoint on it? Because this is a, a sort of biological water resource type of mitigation. Um, if we design it so the fence is closer, does that have an adverse effect biologically, yay or nay? If it's, yes, it still does, then we have to go sort of through another step of saying, you know, it's, it, it has an impact, but it's needed because of this, and you make findings of overriding consideration on the project. In this particular case, okay. it was determined that there was no impact. Right, it was right. Better mm -hmm. if they want. In, in another case, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of feet difference, mm -hmm. put it in the middle of the But it, yeah, it's sort of the same thing as far as engineering design. We have engineering standards, but we allow for modifications of standards if the engineer certifies that this will still work. So we can have a steeper slope because of the rock type, or we can, you know, whatever engineering design is out there, um, there's modification to our standard design, but we rely on the private engineer to say, this is still gonna work for us. It's not going to, it's not gonna fall down, it's not going to create, you know, further erosion, so. I just came up with another problem here. When we're talking about clearing setbacks, does that mean that if there's something growing along the stream, you can't clear it out. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose you have a stream that's choked up with blackberries, non-native invasive blackberries. So nobody can even get to the stream, mm -hmm. and they're sucking up all kinds of water. Or a bunch of other stuff that's grown up over time so that when high water comes, the water wants to jump out of the channel. Does this thing mean that we would have standards that say you can't clean the blackberries out? This would be applied at a discretionary permit level. And um, what we would want to see is that you avoid, it's not intended to, to routine maintenance of, of vegetation along streams, but what we would want to see is just the bulldozer go in there and just you know, clear all the vegetation off it. Um, now, it may be that in some cases that's the best way to clear out blackberries having tried to keep blackberries off of my two and a half acres for many, many years, it's just it's a constant battle. Um, and, um, but in the context of a development project, we'd want to make sure that the, you know, the, the grading of that, not just simply the, you know, the edge of the, the building footprint, but if you're you know, grading an area um, and, and clearing area for construction, that that also is, is avoided. Um, we could add some language that you know, allows for, and, and again, it sort of gets back to what we talked about in the previous issue. The devil's going to be in the details in adopting those standards and the exemptions and, and the, you know, all these other provisions. 
this is not the definitive language. This is just saying this is what we're going to do. And there will be a great deal of work going into adopting these standards, and they ultimately will be reviewed by you and adopted by the board. So, so this would only apply to projects that require discretionary approval? If a landowner just wants to clean out his stream, he can do it? Yeah. yeah. Any other comments before I open the public hearing? I would just say that I think that any time you can take the guesswork out of um, what's going to be required, I think, is, is wonderful from a developer's standpoint as well as less subjective and potentially more expeditious. So with that, is there anyone in the audience would like to address the commission on discussion of water resources and water quality? Vicki Reinke. Um, I think I want to express this concern that Kelly has, and, and it's a legitimate concern, is because we understand that the Army Corps of Engineers has gone far and above what is logical. Um, and I think that's probably troubling to you, which it should be. Um, I live in Greenhorn Creek, and we have Army Corps of Engineers prop, uh, wetlands. When you have property that is under the guise of the Army Corps of Engineers, you cannot clean out the creeks. You cannot clean out your wetlands without, uh, um, without going through hoops. Like, for example, we have big waterways in the uh, golf course that are considered wetlands. Well, the um, Cattails grow real thick in there, and it just takes over the whole waterway. Well, Army Corps of Engineers won't let you pull that stuff out on a normal maintenance basis because it's habitat. Anyway, long story. We had some issues in Greenhorn Creek, so somebody had called in the Army Corps of Engineers to <coughs> settle something. When they came in, they knew what we originally agreed to so many acres of wetlands. So they went around measuring stuff. Well, we evidently lost some wetland through whatever, dryness, maybe all those plants that ate up a lot of the water in the shoreline. We were fined $160,000 because we lost wetlands. Was, so I guess what that's your concern. And I agree, because we know if we start following everything that, that they say, which we might have to, Greenhorn Creek had to bring in, I guess, Army Corps of Engineers to settle wetlands there. So I guess the, my question would be, do we always have to call in Army Corps of Engineers if there's a little puddle in your yard? And, and that may be the case. So I guess, for me, my frustration is with the Army Corps of Engineers. So as citizens, and I know it's not easy because it's away, far away from us, but we have to fight that fight still about getting these people out of our lives. Um, so maybe that's the only solution. But I know what Peter was saying, it sounded like he was trying to help people not put the bad laws on us because Army Corps of Engineers are already going to do that to us. So anyway, that's kind of the way it is. So if you ever go to Greenhorn Creek, you'll notice most of those creeks are covered with berry bushes. Well, our neighbors one time went and cleaned ours out, had a guy hired. They didn't say anything to anybody. And we have the most beautiful creek running by our house. And we're very thankful that they did that. But no, you're not supposed to. So that was just my comment to kind of clarify why you're probably so frustrated. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Cats out of the bag now, though, Vicky. They're going to be over there soon. What's that? Now? The Army Corps, all that. Uh, they might be. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, watching this show. You, they, they're probably watching now. <laughs> yes. Uh, Colleen Platt. Um, I agree with. Actually, Vicky understands that Peter's trying to avoid all all these problems. Um, the stream and wetland setback guidelines are 
to implement policies, blah, 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 COS 1.2, 2.4. This all has to do with water quality, wildlife habitat, riparian corridors, biological resources. So we're trying to avoid those areas so we don't cause the developer problems. And he's trying to facilitate that process. I think that's what we're trying to get to here. So I, I, that, I understand that's what he's doing. Otherwise, we do have to, every project that comes <laughs> forward, every developer has to say, how far do I need to avoid this issue before I have to hire the biologist to tell me this stuff? So if we follow these setbacks, then that helps them avoid problems down the road in their project. So that's, it seems to me this is facilitating and streamlining the process by adopt, adopting these guidelines down the road, which is, we're not doing it now, we're just saying we're going to do it down the road, so. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No? All right. I'm going to bring it back to the commission for discussion. Um, I think that, I mean, I would, I think it's important to leave in here. I think we should be adopting standards and perhaps some um, other wording that I don't know that it's necessary to identify the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers specifically. Um, there was some proposed language about it could be applicable state and federal laws. I just have one question. So it seems like I'm getting it both directions and I'm not quite. What, what Colleen was just saying, if we set the guidelines for the setbacks, they stay in it. I thought I heard you say we still had to hire a biologist, but I thought I heard her say no. they can avoid that. No, if, if they meet the standards, then um, at least as far as wetland <coughs> setback, wetland avoidance requirements, there would not be a need to hire a biologist. Okay. <clears throat> Clearings in this context, if we're talking about water, what's the, what's the definition of a clearing in this context then? Um, well, when I think of clearing, I think of removal of the vegetation. And, uh, well, and then, how does that work with setbacks? Clearing set that doesn't. That so, doesn't so a certain distance from the center of the stream or the edge of the stream, however, do we decide to develop that standard? Is we would not want to see the vegetation removed within there mm -hmm. as a part of the development proposal. Okay. And I and, and you know maybe grading is a better word rather than clearing. Clearing in the, is a verb here, not a noun. Building and clearing <coughs> setback. Um, it's actually, it's an ad, ad for, or it's an adjective. <laughs> a building setback or a clearing or a grading setback. It, it's the... Uh, was an English teacher. I don't know what the <laughs> is. Um, uh, okay. Well, I can understand grading, but it seems to me there might be a lot of reasons to clear along a stream, particularly when you have vegetation that shouldn't be here in the first place, like blackberries that came from India or someplace. I think the, the, the concern from a water quality mm -hmm. biological standpoint is that the vegetation around the stream is important to maintain the quality of the stream. And if you clear all the ve vegetation off, then you're going to have a lot of siltation and runoff, and the habitat quality of that stream zone is degraded. Such as a you know a bunch of cottonwoods along a mm -hmm. river. So I understand that, that invasive blackberries um, are not necessarily good unless you love blackberries like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know for the the biological diversity, although it provides really great habitat mm -hmm. for quail and all kinds of other critters, but it does choke out the stream in some cases, and the native vegetation gets lost. Um, but there are other, uh, there's other vegetation like native willows or other, you know, other plants that grow along the stream, stream side that filter the water when it comes down into the stream, provides the habitat, the feed, whatever it is that's part of that uh, riparian zone habitat. Um, so um, I think as we get into the nitty gritty of developing those standards, we can clarify, we'll define those terms, we'll, uh, we'll identify what type of vegetation removal is exempt from that? 
Uh, I don't think we need to worry so much about the wordsmithing of it right now. Um, if we want to put in clearing <coughs> as opposed to, or grading instead of clearing, um, so that, you know, that might be, um, I, I'm actually more concerned about grading than I am necessarily clearing. Grading? Grading instead of clearing. Grading and wiping everything out. <coughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Clearing, you can leave grass or whatever. So there could be better words for us. I, you know, I, I think again we're talking about pretty much avoiding that area uh, through the, the development process. You know, okay. Construction of buildings, grading of roads, uh, building pads for whatever out there. You know, let's avoid those stream areas. Right. Incorporating that, and I like the idea of mentioning that this is for new development. It was a point that Kelly brought up. Um, may I suggest a language um, change then, which would read, for new development, comma, adopt building and clearing setback standards for intermittent and perennial streams and wetlands that, pardon me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. For new development, comma, adopts building and or um, grading. grading standards that address applicable state and federal requirements regarding intermittent and perennial streams and wetlands, period. I think that the focus on the state and federal standards um, confuses the issue more than what we're trying to accomplish with this. Um, well, I, if anything, I, I would just that. I would just leave it out. Um, but when we when we define the terms within that. The standards. I'm all for leaving it out completely. If you if you can get by with that, just talk about inter intermittent and perennial streams and wetlands. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the question about the intermittent streams: Are, are there state and federal requirements regarding yes. those? Because as you know, they dry up, yep. obviously. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's and there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and and that's why it's uh, as identified on USGS topographic right. maps because the intermittent streams, that's you know, the, the perennial ones are shown as a solid blue line. The intermittent ones are dashed. Very and strange. then there's hundreds of other little seasonal drainages mm -hmm. that carry water for a week or two after a storm and then it's gone. We're talking about the ones that are running for several months out of the year during the wet season, but by early to midsummer they probably dry up and even earlier than that during drought years. But they're they're mapped. It's not something that someone has to go out there and sort of remap all these little drainages. Those are the ones that concerned me on the FEMA maps because they put them in a flood zone because of just exactly the type he was talking about. But, That's but the, why these, I worry are, about these, these are these are, um, and again, this is fairly standard as sort of the threshold. These are the streams that we're concerned about. They're still going to need to design as far as all the grading concerns of how they're going to handle runoff of real projects, and each one of those little drainages are going to have to be looked at as far as the engineering design. But as far as our concern for an environmental resource. Um, those are the ones that that's those are the ones we've identified. So you made a recommendation earlier of just leaving it out. Which portion are you talking about leaving out? The meeting the U.S. Army Corps definition or the language that Mr. Tuno had suggested, which I didn't write down fast enough, but basically was referring to state and federal regulations. And just I would leave be, it out completely. Yeah, and then we develop. Just standards. identify the type of of issue, meaning intermittent perennial streams and wetlands and leave it and, and put a period right there. And I, I don't know that we need four to add to say four new development because I mean we we would have to do that a lot through this general plan. I mean there's a lot of parts of the general plan that you know that the uh, mitigation triggers only for when you have a discretionary project. Okay if by definition all new ordinances are for new development then I don't have a problem with it. I just don't, if this thing isn't going to be looked at for 10 years, I don't want someone to say, to, to interpret this as, as a, um, a, a look back 
kind of an ordinance and that everybody's no. subjected to it. I, I, want, I would want it to be clear now. Now, if you're saying by law that is that can't happen, then... Um, uh, in this case, the county could adopt a standard that says, you know, it applies everywhere, you know, whether you're developing land or not. Or you've I, already developed? Or you already developed. I, I, I doubt that we would do that. But there's nothing that would prohibit the county from doing that. There's actually nothing prohibiting the county from expanding this 10 years from now and saying, you know, we've got this huge impact. People are going out there and, you know, decimating all the streams, and we're going to adopt rules and regulations to prevent, prevent that. Um, this gives us the guidelines of what we intend to do. So whether we have four new development or not, I don't think it really matters. It's clear if your concern is that somehow the county is going to impose um, sort of a, a, retroactive. a retroactive type of rule, it's not really retroactive, it's just a rule that applies to anyone working in the stream area. Right. Um, but at least that would, that would tell the, the, person, the, the people a decade from now the intent, our intent, was that it applied to new development. If you want to change it, go through that fight, but it was the intent of the people here and now, 2016, that it applied to new development. Yeah. Now, if you have an <coughs> intermittent stream that's shown on these USGS topo maps, th does that kick in Corps of Engineers requirements or EBA requirements or anybody else's requirements? Um, it, I know it kicks in the State Department of Fish and Game requirements. Kicks in the what? State Department of Fish and Game stream bed alteration requirements. Okay. <coughs> and if it's not on the USGS topo map, it does not kick in those requirements? That's my understanding. So that's a, that's a necessary modifier. I think that's an important modifier, yes. We're not talking about every little drainage that maybe flows for you know, a few weeks. We're talking about those ones that are sort of identified you know, on the map significantly that you know, everyone sort of knows, okay, here, there's a stream here. It's more than just a seasonal drainage. So it seems like we're, we've got some except for Kelly. Do you have another question, Kelly? More discussion? Otherwise, I'm going to ask Peter to maybe read what he's... Did we change any language? Peter? Yeah. Um, so let me just, what I think I heard, for new development, adopt building and or grading. I don't know if we want to leave setback standards in there or just standards. Um, I think that's a question. Grading setback standards for intermittent and perennial streams as identified by USGS topo maps, blah, 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 and wetlands, period. The standards may contain a provision for reduction setbacks based on qualified biologist's recommendation. I think it's important to have uh, setbacks in there just because it clarifies what the standards are focused on. I, I would agree, yeah. but it's your guys' call. The word well, standard setbacks. follows <laughs> setbacks. Setback standards, standards. yes. Um, building and Grading setback standards. Yeah, setback standards. I think that's okay. Yeah, okay. good. Are we good with I'm that? Good. All right. So, is I guess I, we are doing motions. I guess is there a or do we keep going? Well, I think that was what the only change that we're going to defer one B. Right. We had no change to one A. And no one, change to one E. Right. So, so I think that you can make a motion on. Let's do those. Um, we'll bring one B back. Um, after discussion with Public Works, and we'll make the modifications I just read into the record. Okay. Um, so is there a motion? So oh, moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. We're moving on to biological resources. Anything on 2A database? Not here. No. 2B, mitigation options for biological resources? No. No? Mm -mm. 
2C, Habitat Conservation Plan for Amphibians. Mine has a blank for the responsible entity. Pardon me, I didn't hear you, what? <clears throat> Mine has a blank for the responsible entity. Oh, oh. mine too. Uh, that would be us. Planning Department. <clears throat> and who, I guess the only question I have is, who are we gonna share that cost with? Neighboring counties? Um, and that would cover, how, how are we? Hopefully the state and the federal government. So, the benefit of a habitat conservation plan is similar to what we talked about before, is you've got a plan, um, you sort of know what the mitigation requirements are, there may be areas we decide, okay, here's critical habitat that shouldn't be developed, here's areas that's got a habitat, but it can be developed if we offset that, mitigate that somehow. Um, and it's looked at sort of holistically, all the agencies involved agree, and that's both a positive and a negative because it's a time-consuming process. Um, but it seems to be the most effective way to sort of get out from under um, constant overview by Fish and Wildlife Services to you know, look at every single project and come up with independent mitigation on everything and have to reinvent the wheel with every project. So anytime we have a project you know, where there's um, endangered species habitat or plant habitat, something like that, we've got to work with them and negotiate. Uh, in El Dorado County, uh, we had an area of unique soils that had a number of rare plants on it and it was very, very difficult to get them to agree that this is sufficient mitigation. Um, but if we have a habitat conservation plan, um, and I want to use that in sort of lower case terminology, <laughs> a conser conservation plan, habitat conservation plan, or a um, natural communities NCCP, natural communities conservation plan, or sort of terms of art used by the state and federal agencies to developing a certain type of plan. Um, doesn't necessarily mean we are going to adopt that, you know, hopefully there's, you know, they've evolved over time. Um, they're, you know, but it's a cooperative effort between the county or multiple counties if the habitat, you know, covers you know, more, more jurisdictions and the state and federal wildlife agency to come up with a plan that looks at sort of broad-based mitigation rather than a, you know, project by project approach. Any other questions? I'm the, I don't have a note until 2D, so. Oak Woodlands for good? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, wildlife quarters slash crossing. No, Oak Woodlands. I, I, no. 2D. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, 2D, Oak Woodlands. Yeah, there's a, there is a statute on that, and my recollection of it is uh, <clears throat> it sets forth mitigation measures in the statute that are available. And it also allows counties to uh, come up with additional mitigation measures that would be acceptable. And I take it that what's going on here is, is an effort to do that. Is that correct? This would be um, to adopt a plan that's consistent with state law. And then the last sentence there is sort of an interim standard um, that would be in place that we would apply on a project-by-project -project basis until some other program is established that is consistent with state law and you know, mitigates the impact to oaks. Well, I, th I think if you, if you track the statute, <clears throat> it would read something like this. Develop mitigation measures in addition to those provided in the Oak Woodlands Preservation Act where the county determines that a project may result in a significant effect on oak, oak woodlands to facilitate the environmental review process, et cetera, as you have it here. I think that more accurately captures what the statute is allowing the county, or giving the county the opportunity to do. I don't have the statute in front of me, I'm going off my notes. Could you read your, sorry, the first 
part of that sentence. Can yeah. you read that again? Develop mitigation measures in addition to those provided in the Oak Woodlands Preservation Act, where the county determines that a project may result in a significant effect on Oak Woodlands to facilitate, et cetera. The only concern I would have about that is develop mitigation measures, and so it gets back to the individual. Maybe develop a mitigation program? That would be fine. Mm -hmm. So this program applies only to a proposal that, that is deemed to have ha deemed to have a significant effect. That's how the statute reads. Um, <clears throat> but we're also talking about cumulative impacts to Oak Woodlands because after it says to facilitate environmental review process relative to mitigating significant, direct, and cumulative impacts. So, and that's really the, the focus of um, PRC 21083.4 is that you're looking at the cumulative loss of oak woodland habitat throughout the state. Um, but it's directed to a discretionary project. So <clears throat> someone with a discretionary project proposal comes to us and we say, you know what? It's too bad for you, but there's been a cumulative effect up to this point, so we got to hit you harder. No, no, they would be participating in their fair share of the ongoing cumulative loss of book, book woodlands um, as a result of what we've identified in the general plan. So um, typically what we would do now is, um, you know, someone is, comes in with a project and they need to identify how much uh, Oak Woodland is, is on the property, how much would be removed as a part of development, um, and then individually mitigate that somehow. Um, replant oak somewhere else on the property, uh, acquire some additional um, conservation easement, variety of different, different methods. Uh, this program would sort of establish that, here's, here's what you need to do if you're removing two acres of Oak Woodland, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and you know, here are the options that you have. Okay, then maybe I'm not understanding the, the cumulative effect component. So the cumulative effect is that, you know, removal of an acre of oak is not going to um, have a significant impact on the oak woodlands in California. But if you multiply that by, you know, thousands of times throughout the state, there's a loss. Um, and so any removal of oak trees, and there's some threshold, you know, if it's less than, you know, typically less than, I think maybe an acre, it, it, it's not, considered uh, um, significant. But anything over a certain threshold that's established through this program would say, okay, you need now to participate in um, the mitigation program and your fair share of it, uh, looking not all the past you know, loss that occurred, but you know, future ongoing um, losses that would likely occur. Do you foresee this being a matter of percentage of canopy or number of trees? Typically it's done by canopy. It's easier, you know, rather than go out there and count every individual trees, you can use aerial photography. Well, there's or, a way to define a woodland. It's yeah. not an oak tree, it's a woodland. Right. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a threshold you have to meet to be considered a woodland. And again, I see, I mean, I see this a lot like with, um, um, even the Habitat Conservation Plan is giving, um, is having guidelines that, again, informs people developing their property about um, what they could expect if they are reducing oak woodland canopy about the opportunities for mitigating that. You know, oak woodlands are important, especially in this county especially if we look at our tourism and visitor dollars. There are woodlands and then there are woodlands. Pardon me? There are oak woodlands and then there are other oak woodlands that shouldn't exist, actually. Live oak thickets. My bigger problem is with, is with the, the next sentence, but I don't want to go there unless if there's, if you want to hash out this first part of it. 
<clears throat> well, I do think I would suggest having it read, develop a mitigation program in addition to mitigation measures provided in the Oak Woodlands Preservation Act where the county determines that a project may result in a significant effect on Oak Woodlands to facilitate the environmental review process relative to mitigating significant direct and cumulative impacts to Oak Woodlands in conjunction with discretionary project approval. I like that language and it makes sense to me. <laughs> you read that. There's no way I wrote that. Too. I know, right. <laughs> right. Got it all. <laughs> I got develop. <laughs> I, I, got, I got past that. Yeah. That mitigation program. <laughs> No, Let me make sure I have it. Develop a mitigation program in addition to mitigation measures provided in the Oak Woodland Woodlands Preservation Act to facilitate the environmental and then the rest of it as well. No, you left another out phrase in there that where the county determines that a project may result in a significant effect on Oak Woodlands, then pick up to facilitate, etc. Because that's that's coming out of the the act. It's a qualifier that I think needs to be in there. I think you might, there might be a repetitive piece, not that it's a big deal, but if you end it with, um, uh, with respect to discretionary projects, correct? Yeah, that, as it is in the draft. Okay, but then you, if you just move discretionary, if you just describe your previous project as a discretionary project, then you don't need to repeat it down here. It's a minor issue. I, I didn't describe it as discretionary. I know you didn't, but if you do, then doesn't that, no, there was no additional. Didn't add. Yeah, didn't, didn't add, add anything about discretionary. No. Okay. Uh, where the county determines a project will have a significant effect on Oak Woodlands was inserted in. To facility, and then it goes on as as the draft provides. To facility. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm a second uh, sentence guy. Uh, are, are we good with the first sentence? Are you? Does that work for you, Peter? Um, I think it. it if that's what you guys want, it, it, it makes sense. It, it, I think it covers the intent of the policy. Okay. Second second. I, yeah, I think so. Okay. We'll have public comment, but right now it makes sense. But not right the second, but you have a part on that. Yeah, the only uh, part, of, the question I have on the second sentence is with this, this interim, in the interim, uh, continue to apply a replacement standard of three to one. Um, I take it that's been in place for some time, and, and my question is, where does that come from? Does that come from the Oak Woodlands Preservation Act, so we're just adopting a piece of it right now, and we'll get, we'll get to the whole program later? I believe so. I'm, yeah, I'm frankly not, not sure. This it's is been in place a, a long standard time. the county has used for a number of years mm -hmm. to mitigate impacts to Oak Woodlands. Ever since I've been here, it's been. And when a person is complying with this three to one, how do they do that? Do they plant a little bitty oak tree because they've cut down uh, they they, three little bitty ones because they cut down another one? Typically, it's setting aside either on, on site or, or identifying off site area where you say, okay, we're, we're taking out uh, two acres of oak woodland, so we're going to set aside um, six acres that won't be uh, disturbed in the future. So it's not really a replacement standard, it's a preservation standard. Right. right. So I have a problem with that. Well, I think that you can replace it, though, I think, Peter. It could be replacement. I think it, it, is, it is replacement, uh, too. Replacement and or preservation. Yes. So sometimes it's a combination of both. It could be areas that are um, disturbed, um, that are replanted. Well, now I'm confused. <clears throat> it says lost oak canopy. Is that, are you going tree by tree, or are you saying, okay, you took out an acre of oaks. No, I think it still has to be an oak woodland. That's still the my impression. Well, yeah, an acre of oak, oak canopy. Right. Is how we measure it. It's not by trees. It's by canopy. So in some areas you have, you know, a, a denser cluster of trees, and you measure the entire knot. You have to count, you know, 200 trees in there. Okay. So what defines a canopy? If it's if it's widespread oaks. <coughs> Widely dispersed, that's not a canopy. There's a, there's a standards for that. I don't know if it's 10% mm -hmm. or 30% or whatever, but there is a standard for, for Looking definition down on it, yeah, of yeah. what a canopy is. It can't summer. be mm -hmm. one here and one there and one over there. <clears throat> so, first it has to be a, a canopy, however, that's got defined, and then it has to be 
typically has to be defined or, as or oak woodland, woodland, and there's a definition of oak woodland. And it can be sort of, I mean, there's oak savanna, which is, you know, trees sort of interspersed out in the grassland, and there's a certain density at which point it becomes oak woodland. It's not solid oak tree. Um, there's oak forest, there's, you know, it's all sort of oak, oak woodland as a broad definition. And so um, that's something that will have to be worked out as to what is that definition. Right, right now, we basically co count the total canopy of individual trees or clusters of trees. Okay, now, now I'm confused on another level. I thought we knew what the standards were. You're saying we have to kind of define that now? I, well, I, when we come up with a, a a program, we will refine those definitions more. Um, it's it's a little vague in the state law. My my experience, past experience with it. Um, I mean, there's some very clear definitions, but how it's been applied in various ju di different jurisdictions varies quite a bit. Um, there's quite a bit of debate over how it should be applied. Where where does the three to one come from? I mean, I don't understand why somebody has to. <coughs> provide three times the amount that they took. That's a state standard, right? I don't know that I, it is. I, I don't know that that actually comes out of the act, but I think it's been recognized as a, a reasonable um, mitigation. Is that just an assumption of survival rate? Mortality is part of it, yeah. So they figured that two thirds of them were gonna die? No, 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 it's, it's, well, part of it is you're still losing oak canopy. And the idea of setting aside other areas or, you know, in, in, in replanting, yes, there's going to be mortality. And over time, you know, the stronger trees are going to grow. And, you know, over several decades, you'll end up getting a recovered oak woodland. Um, and the strong trees will, will grow and shade out the weaker ones, and there will be some, some death. But initially, there's going to be just some mortality, the ones that just don't take. Um, but that's a whole different aspect of it. The idea is more the area of an acre of oaks, and if someone doesn't have, if you're developing land and you don't have excess land to say, well, we're going to replant over here, then the idea is that, well, we've lost an acre, but if we set aside three acres over here, then that oak woodland is protected. And that's been recognized as being effective mitigation, even though it's a net loss over time of oak trees. Okay, now if you have a really thick live oak thicket around dog towns there, up San Domingo Creek, that nothing can get through, and you're going to wind up wiping that biological desert out as part of your project, do you have to then either replace that live oak thicket with another one someplace and thereby render that ground totally unusable, or um, agree somehow that three times that amount of live oak thickets will be there. Also, I mean, related I mean, to I'm, that, I'm not getting part of this. But I, I have a question, too, about uh, there are only, I know all oaks aren't created equal. And right. I don't know if live oaks are subject to this. I mean, I think like blue oaks and white oaks. And I don't know if live oaks are protected under this. Well, the, the, I don't know. The, well, that's um, not part of my question. Yeah, yeah, I know. There are two oak tree species that have a higher uh, level of importance, and those are the, the valley live oak and the, um, the blue oak. And so typically those types of woodlands have um, a higher level of, of mitigation. Um, the state says that all oak woodlands are important, um, and... Yes, there are interior live oak thickets that um, are not, certainly not as attractive as the uh, you know, speckled hillside of blue oaks or a beautiful big standing, um, but they serve uh, habitat value. I, I would disagree that they're impenetrable and that they're a biological desert. I think they're, they're very rich in wildlife, and that's the whole point, is that they may not be as attractive from a marketing standpoint of, of land sales, but it certainly provides important habitat. And that's something that we're going to have to look at. And again, this, this gets to the heart of the EIR and the impact of future development in the county and what's, you know, how are we going to offset and mitigate um, the loss of these, um, these habitat areas. 
The other thing I would say for the three to one is also there are the oak trees likely that you would be removing are big and there could be heritage trees or grand oaks. The trees that you're going to be replacing are probably pretty small. So again, it's the mortality, but also even the visual, you know, the impact I think as well. So of just size. Well, <clears throat> one more comment on live oaks. The reason we have the live oak thickets that we have is because we have kept the fires out of them for 100 years. They didn't used to be here. They are totally unnatural. The Indians didn't have them. And we're just compounding that really gross error if we're going to apply this kind of thing to those thickets. That's my judgment. OK. I've got a more of a practical question here. If you've got a, a parcel of land, and let's say hypothetically it is it is all oak canopy, <coughs> but you want to do something with it. You want to be able to put a few houses in there, where you and a road that feed uh, services them, and and you're going to have to have a pad cutouts and driveway, what you are going to reduce the canopy to some effect. Mm -hmm. But the whole lot is that way, so it's you don't have a portion of that lot that you can transfer that canopy to under this three to one ratio. You can't do it. Right. So what do you? What's your, what are your options? You have to buy a, a piece of land somewhere else and create oak canopy, or go, or somebody offers an oak canopy uh, conservation uh, portion uh, district that you, uh, um, a piece of land that you that you buy into. A mitigation that, bank someplace. Yeah, that would be an option. So that has to exist in order for you to do anything with your property. Mm -hmm. And that's state law that's requiring us to do that? Yeah. Well, I don't know that we need the second sentence at all. The county, if the county's been doing what it's been doing without it being in a general plan, why does it have to be in here? where it's locked in. I think the, the point of that is that when we um, analyze the general plan under the EIR, we'll, they'll be looking at how long is it going to take for the county to implement all of these programs and what's going to happen in the interim. What will be the environmental impact? Um, and so this sort of sets forth the mitigation that the county will apply in the interim until this program is adopted. Um, so that it's, it's um, preempting or, or, or pre-identifying what potential mitigation measures. So when, when the EIR looks at what's the impact of develop, future development uh, from this general plan, there will be a loss of, of oak trees. You know, as development occurs, oak trees will be removed. Um, we don't know exactly how much, but there will be an estimate of how much there. What are we going to do to mitigate it? Well, we're going to develop this program. What happens in, at the time in between now and then, development's going to still occur. Um, what's the mitigation at that point in time? Here's what we've identified we're going to do. OK, you've mitigated. Very simplistically, but that's, that's the reason to have an interim measure established in the plan itself. Um, we don't have to have it in there, but um, I think it will assist us in getting through the EIR process by identifying what we're going to do on an interim basis where we can. Does the 1996 plan have that in it? Uh, I really doubt it. Well, and I, I think it's important in there as well. And, and in the fact that we have been, this has been our policy for at least the eight years I've been around. I'm going to go back to my question. Same parcel of land. An oak canopy starts at a certain percentage of coverage, the, Im the image looking down, right? Mm -hmm. It starts at that percentage, but it could be more. It could be denser than that. Let's say, did you say 30%? I don't know. I'm just guessing. Uh, yeah, it could be. Fine, with, yeah. for purposes mm -hmm. of discussion. It, start, uh, it starts at 30% coverage as That's you're looking lot. from an aerial view 
uh, with foliage on the trees. But it could be 50, 60, 70 percent coverage, right? Could be thicker. Could be. Yeah. So, would the mitigation measure allow the person who's doing this little few houses in there with their pads and their driveways and the road say, okay, I'm going to increase the density from what it was to this greater amount on a three to one basis for the land that I'm taking, for the coverage that I'm taking. I don't have to go to a bank and do it. If there's land on, on site that they could mitigate, yes, that's, that's feasible. Not bare land, canopy land, but it's at a density that it's got room for greater density. You mean? Just add so on. You, so you've got? So you intersperse trees in your canopy area that increases the density of it without having to go to a mitigation mm -hmm. bank. So he's just I, saying you've got yeah, you've so, so you have areas within the property that don't have oak trees on it, and you're going to intersperse those. So no, no, that. he's that, saying that you are canopy. You, you already you have a piece of property. Let's say that it's 100% canopy, mm -hmm. but at a density of 30%. Could he make it? You know, just increase the density to 50% canopy. Right. Right. And it's still, but I, th I don't know. I am. I don't know the yeah. answer to that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I don't know. Well, um, I mean, other kind of details we'd have to work out as right. far but as that's something that could yeah. be included mm -hmm. in this in this conservation management program. That's, yes. that would be an allowable measure. Could be conceivably yes. Of course, if you get too thick, your grass doesn't grow very good. <laughs> well, at some point in time, you've got as we it's canopy, grass and we're not right. increasing right. canopy; we're just changing the canopy. That's what we should be and that's not trying to preserve. Um, you know, it, it, I think we'd have to look at it more on a case-by-case -case basis. Of, of. <laughs> so, are you, do we need further discussion on this item? I, um, I, th I, person, I think it's important to keep the three to one in there for the reasons that Peter said, and the fact that this is what we're already this is what we're already uh, implementing. I'd like to look at what the state law is mandating before we put a number in there. That was the earlier question that I had. Is that where did the three to one come from? And Peter's saying it, it comes from the act. I, I do believe it. Act. That's my recollection. Is that that is at least it's the I think in the guidelines too, for it open. doesn't seem like we're getting a straight solid. The, there's some complications or some mixed interpretations into the state law. Well, we're going back and looking at a, one or so two. So maybe other we could maybe get a little more. Too. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that to my okay. list of questions. All right. But we're good with the edits on the first part. We're just talking about the three to one. Right. Right? Okay. Well, but then when that comes back, we could change our mind, too. Well, it could happen. <laughs> Do we want to just take lunch break now? So take me to. Yes, I think so. So are there, I'm just going to, are there a lot of comments on 2E, 2F, 2G? Substantive? On 2D? No. 2E, 2F, or oh, 2G? Oh, 2E, I have questions. And we made some changes when we were back on the policies. I had some notes on that, too. So perhaps we should just take lunch now. Oh, great idea. Good idea. Okay. So uh, back here at 120.